we uh, have this uh, arrangement today as a collaboration between uh, ATMP Sweden and uh, which is the kind of the cover umbrella for all the uh, activities around ATMP in Sweden, but also Alliance for Regenerative Medicine. And um, uh, for us, uh, uh, Justin and I are here to guide you through this. Uh, this afternoon, we will have three different parts of this, the, the session. There will be a number of presentation initially, and then we will have a panel on the European legislation, and then finally we'll also discuss uh, joint clinical assessment as, as part of health technology assessment. So, Justin, uh, tell me a, a bit who you are. Uh, why are you here to co-host this with me? Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm a researcher by training and have a high interest in the ATMP field. I have been working with gene therapists uh, previously, but now, my, uh, now I'm a senior research expert at the Swedish Childhood Cancer Fund, which is a non-for-profit organization that funds research in the area of childhood cancer. And I'm also a patient representative in the European Medicines Agency's Committee for Advanced Therapies. And Dag, who are you? Uh, I'm, I'm a policy person at the uh, Pharma Industry Association in Sweden and also a member of this uh, innovation space, uh, ATMP, Sweden leading in ATMP by 2030. Uh, and in addition to this, my, my background is in, in drug development and commercialization of, of products. So um, we have some practicalities, don't we? Mm, yes, absolutely. We would first let you know that this uh, event is recorded for later viewing, so that you know that. And uh, in the unlikely event of an emergency, you have the emergency exit signs, as you can see the green uh, signs, signs around this uh, venue. And uh, if uh, we have not planned any questions uh, from the audience during the two panels, uh, however, we, we hope that we, in the end of each panel, will uh, be able to take some questions from the audience. So this event is jointly organized by the Alliance for Gener Generative Medicine and ATM Sweden uh, in partnership with the Swedish Presidency uh, of Europe. And it's an official satellite event to the Swedish Presidency's uh, conference on life science uh, called the Era of Personalized Medicine, which took place yesterday and this uh, morning in this uh, very venue. And as a satellite, this event will uh, intend, intends to complement the discussions that has been around pre uh, precision medicine or personalized medicine at the official conference, but then also specializing in uh, ad advanced therapies or cell and gene therapies and, and tissue engineered products. Um, and it's called an ATMP or advanced therapy medicinal products in the European uh, legislation lingo. Mm -hmm. And the fact that both of these events were organized in Sweden under the Swedish presidency tells uh, something about the ambition and the vision of, uh, of Sweden in uh, life science and in the ATMP field and in, uh, uh, in innovation in medicine. And as you know, uh, ATMPs are, are uh, quite different from regular medicines in that they, uh, to some extent, uh, are built from living material uh, cells, living cells, and, and some, sometimes uh, patient donor cells. Uh, and through the manufacturing and through the uh, risk-benefit analysis, they become then pharmaceutical products. And, but they still have some additional features that are quite different and, and warrants a collaboration and, and a cross-sectoral cross, uh, approach in this. And this is what we will discuss as well. Uh, so, so over to you. Mm -hmm. So during this event, we will look at the state of the ATMP uh, sector in Europe, and we will discuss challenges and opportunities to bring these new innovative therapies to the patients. Uh, in particular, we will focus on two uh, very topical developments uh, currently uh, being pursued in, in Europe. And the first one, as we have heard here, it is the revision of the Europe, uh, EU pharmaceutical legislation. And the second is uh, the European Joint Clinical Assessment uh, of ATMP, which was uh, requested in the new regulation uh, for health technology assessment. 
And uh, with that introduction, I'd like to hand over to Jim Lund. He is the, uh, the leader of the Swedish uh, uh, initiative or innovation space, Sweden uh, world leading in ATMP by 2030. So welcome, Jim. Thank you, Doug. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here speaking to all of you, both in the audience and also online. And uh, we have been working uh, on this for a long time. And, and I would like to add to what Doug said that uh, the ATMP 2030 Innovation Milieu project also actually builds on uh, us working on a national level uh, with national collaboration that's been going on even before this project, but around four years ago, uh, we started to say, now it's, we're ready to take this to the next step. And uh, we s went to, out to our stakeholders to see who wanted to uh, chip in and uh, lead the way, which I would say it's a quite uh, ambitious uh, vision that uh, Sweden would be a leader within this area. Uh, but uh, I think uh, we have to <laughs> try. Uh, I want to say a couple of words about ATMP Sweden. Uh, so I think it's a bit unclear for a lot of people what ATMP Sweden really is. And uh, it's just launched actually as a not-for-profit association run by a number of projects, uh, but for the benefit of the ecosystem. So we want like an umbrella association or organization that everybody can feel that they're part of. Um, so a lot of the focus there is therefore on the communication, engagement, stakeholder involvement. Uh, we have our conferences. We were very happy when ARM uh, reached out to us uh, to co-host this event. But we also have our national conferences annually and also the ATMP World Tour, which starts actually tomorrow. So if you haven't uh, registered, feel free to go to our homepage and, and do that. And uh, to say something about Sweden and our, our vision, uh, we are strong research nations. Uh, when they rank uh, countries for how innovative they are, we usually pr score pretty high. Uh, and uh, we have been working a lot with our national ecosystem uh, to bridge actually kind of the gaps that we see in the in the innovation system. Uh, and I like this image because it places the patient at the very center of this. Because in the end of the day, if the whole system doesn't work, it's actually the patient who will not see the benefits of all the investment we do in research and development. So it's very important, I think, that all of these uh, uh, circles has to uh, function. and and. I also want to add, this is on the national level, but also on the European and even global level, this has to actually function. And I think that is a lot of what this kind of meeting is about. So for us in ATMP Sweden, I mean, yes, we want to work and collaborate with our local stakeholders here, but it's also very important to connect with the world so that uh, people outside of Europe or Sweden can actually join in and we can together we can become even better than uh, we are on our own and i think uh, that uh, with arm hair who will go through the state of the area in the in the european union i think uh, this uh, kind of image is also important on that level that uh, this has to work on a European level if we want to be in this uh, game and if we want to be competitive. So that's all I have to say. If I can get a sound, yeah, maybe a follow up question to you. Yeah. Jim. You have been now the, the leader for this um, uh, initiative, this cross, cross sectional initiative for, for a couple of years or a number of years, uh, and you're about to shift jobs into one of the areas in, uh, spe more specific in this. Yes. What's your expectations on, on your new job in that relationship? And what is it to, to start with? Good question. Uh, yes, so I mean, like I said, we've been working with, with all this to get to rig the innovation system and gap, bridge the gaps that were there. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're very happy that we got support from our Swedish government. I also want to add that we're very happy that we have gotten support from Vinova and other funding authorities uh, throughout the years. But just two, uh, a month ago, <laughs> it was announced that there will be created a national infrastructure for the commercialization of advanced therapies, which is called CCRM Nordic. Mm. And as you uh, implied, I will start working there. 
Okay, well, congratulations. And, and I think uh, uh, just to kind of uh, put this in the context, uh, the gap that, uh, that um, now Jim will move into is, uh, is an important gap to fill to help uh, research translate into product development uh, and uh, how to do uh, uh, good clinical practice manufacturing of, of also for research purposes. So it's an important initiative. And we expect to see the, uh, the, the, the Minister of, uh, for Energy and Business and Industry uh, entering uh, sometime any minute here. And I think uh, we'll use the time and, and in order to kind of uh, honor the uh, the Swedish government uh, then willingness to, to fund this initiative, uh, both the, the, the wider ATMP Sweden, but also then the, uh, the more specific than CCM, CCRM Nordic in, in that sense. Um, we just waiting for a prompt to, to get the next speaker on board. Uh, so, uh, but I, I yes. guess I can add yeah, a bit. You can uh, comment a bit to, on it, yes, so please. I think uh, I mean, one of the challenges, obviously, with advanced therapies is that it's never been so close between, I mean, the patient and the product, uh, and uh, it, it, I think it makes a very complex uh, innovation system. So I think that's why it's very important to work on a systemic level, which I also think is true for for Europe. I mean, that all the you know pieces has to fit. We are. We have a similar culture. I mean, similar healthcare systems, and and so on. So I think certainly there should be a lot of benefit there. Okay. No. I, and I I would think that you you you're probably a little bit shy because I I would think that you hope also to see some European entries uh, arriving at your doors and and and, uh, and so. Yes, absolutely. I mean, and we're here to talk about the European competitiveness. So I think that's important. So do we have? Uh, uh, anybody to join us, or should we uh, continue this? Uh, we have had um, uh, during the Swedish uh, EU pre presidency just the last couple of days. There's been this this session on life science, and uh, uh, part of that has been personalized medicine. I think uh, ATMPs are a great part of, of personalized medicine and the whole idea about uh, precision in, in diagnosis linked to, to, to actual treatment, but it's not exactly the same. Uh, so um, I think uh, it, uh, this is a way of actually bridging the two things quite well and, and then here and now uh, dig into a, a, a new transformative area for, for new types of medicines, I think, in, in that sense. So I understand that we have uh, somebody to come come on board and uh Hi. Hello. Sorry, I, I missed the introduction back there. That's, that's, Hi. Uh, so please, uh, Ms. Bush, uh, the, the Minister for Energy, uh, Business and Industry. That's a mouthful. So uh, It really is. Yeah. Mother of two, party leader and yeah, uh, so yeah, forth that, and so on. That's included as well. So welcome and please. Mostly very happy to be here and thank you so much for this opportunity to um, meet with you today and to discuss one of the most I would say really one of the most important topics on the EU agenda that uh, we, we should really be more um, that are discussing. So uh, as you've understood, my name is uh, Ebba Bush. I also had a, have the honor of leading the new department for climate and enterprise, bringing those two areas together in Ulf Christesson's government here in, in Sweden. And I, uh, as you've understood, I'm also the party leader. I've had the honor of being the party leader for the Christian Democratic uh, Party here in Sweden for uh, over eight years now. And I, um, I think that some of you might have noticed that the Ministry of Social Affairs is populated with uh, my party colleagues. And this is because healthcare remains at the very core of our party. We put people before systems. Our policies are based on the premises that um, humans build systems and systems exist for humans, not the other way around. A well-functioning healthcare system is really a basic prerequisite for a thriving society. Constantly improving healthcare, medicine and healthcare methods is therefore essential. All children who develop cancer in Sweden are now offered whole genome sequencing. 
This increases our knowledge about why childhood cancer occurs and improves the possibilities of giving each child a faster and more detailed diagnosis. And this is, of course, a crucial step to improving treatments and prognosis. Knowledge of specific genetic changes will give some of these children access to targeted precision treatment. Tens of thousands of blood cancer patients across the globe, adults as well as children, have already been treated with CAR T cells, a game-changing personalized immunotherapy. This really gives a hint, but I think only just a hint, of what is to expect from the future and the hundreds of ongoing clinical trials for advanced therapies. And um, as I said earlier here in another setting this afternoon, I know that you, you all know this, but sometimes I think it's good for us to just pause for a second and just reflect upon what we are really aiming to do with the work that we are filling our everyday agendas with. Your work has already made it possible for mothers and fathers to get to see their children grow up that otherwise would not have. Your work will pave the way for a future which will be easier for many more to live, for making this happen, to be able to see this become a reality. We, as policymakers, must give you the right conditions. So, the Swedish government will continue to prioritize the life science sector and building Swedish and European competitiveness because that's also really what it is about. It is crucial to create con these conditions in, in Europe that makes it easy and beneficial for life science companies to develop their products and to grow their businesses here early adoption or uh, adoption of the new innovations in other is another cornerstone for building competitiveness. And I think that the European Union really is at a crossroad now where we need to see that sometimes the devil is maybe not in, in the details, but the dev devil really is in the bottom line of all of the policy making where we need to look at the bottom line and, and, and see, are we telling the industry, yes, continue to invest in Europe, the, there is a bright and strong future here within the European Union, or is the bottom line, the sum of all of the policy making, really telling businesses and the industry to go elsewhere? That's the crossroad where we are at. The implementation of personalized medicine really creates fantastic tools for healthcare professionals and opportunities for patients, but also brings a quite grand systemic challenge for our society. Digitalization of the healthcare system, access to health uh, data, payment models for expensive new drugs, supply of competence to develop, uh, and production and implementation of advanced therapies. Those are quite tough challenges. And with the newly concluded presidency com uh, conference, Sweden uh, uh, aim to put the spotlight on this inevitable development. And I would like to thank ATMP Sweden and uh, ARM for hosting this side event for continued in-depth discussions. I hope that you will travel home today or later tomorrow with a sense of hope and direction for your work ahead. The Swedish government has prioritized biological uh, pharmaceuticals for over a decade with investments in infrastructures and, and programs. And this spring, the government initiated a public-private partnership to build an innovation cluster for commercialization, competence development, and production capacity for advanced therapies, such as cell therapies, CCRM Nordic, and this innovation cluster will function as an infrastructure and competence node for the benefit of companies throughout Sweden and Europe. CCRM Nordic will collaborate with uh, already established innovation hubs and the rest of the ecosystem for advanced therapies to create an environment that will allow companies to develop their products all the way right here in Sweden. The government protects the 
competitiveness of the Swedish life science industry and will follow the development of the new pharmaceutical regulation for the EU closely. I repeat that, we will follow it very closely. One of the main points of the suggested EU pharmaceutical legislation is to increase the adoption across the EU of new innovation therapies or innovative therapies, something that would benefit patients and strengthen EU as a launch area for new products and clinical trials. And, and the question is, how could this be achieved in the best possible way? because there are a few ditches where we won't, we're not interested in, in landing. We need to find a good way to move forward. I think uh, I'll stop there. I'd just like to come back once again um, to, to my beginning and say uh, thank you so much for, for having me this afternoon. And I wish you fruitful discussion and good luck with both your research and your commercialization of the research. I really do believe that in your hands, uh, you hold the key to future health and well-being for so many. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Uh, is there time for a, a brief uh, yeah. follow-up question? Uh, we're, we're, as you mentioned, we're, we're in the, at the close of the Swedish EU presidency. What, um, what do you take home from this? Uh, if Sweden has the ambition to be a world leader, and all the other European countries would do so. Uh, will this happen or uh, where do you see Sweden in that con context or that contest? Well, I'm, I'm, I used to be a, a, a city commissioner in the, the university city of Uppsala. And there we have the, uh, have the landmark of, uh, of the huge uh, the cathedral and the castle. But then you also had the reference point of uh, uh, Farmacia. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I'm, uh, I grew up in a, in a city where, where uh, the life science was uh, uh, really noted in the everyday life of so many in, in, in many different ways. And I would say that um, Sweden s still has a very high uh, ambition for the life uh, science sector. Uh, I think that we, um, uh, we we are now at a crossroad, as I said in, in my um, uh, introductory remarks, where we have the risk of regulating in a way that if you take each and every detail of the regulation, oh, we could live with that, that could work, we can live with that. Uh, but if you sum all of those decisions, the sum of the policy making, I think that um, we are now uh, suffering a great risk of pushing investments elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And that is where I see Sweden coming into play, both um, at a national level where we have a homework to do, uh, but also within the European Union. And coming out of the EU presidency in just a few days, uh, you will still you will hear a very vocal Swedish um, um, Swedish member states within the European Union pushing uh, for seeing life science as uh, really a strategic area for both healthcare, for well-being, uh, for competitiveness, but also as an important crucial part of actually global security issues. Uh, it, it really now, in this very challenging times, it also is a matter of making sure that we have the right competence uh, within sort of friends and families uh, that, that share the same common values. And, and that's the voice that we will uh, aim to be in the coming years. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, let's, uh, let's give uh, Ms. Abel Bush a great applause for this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So now it's time to hand over to Sara Masur from Knut and Alice Wallenberg Foundation. So Sara has been leading the foundation, foundation's strategic program since 2018 and is now named as the incoming director of the foundation. The Knut and, Allenberg, uh, Knut and Alice Wallenberg Foundation is one of the most important non-governmental uh, benefactors of academic research in Sweden. So, uh, Ms. Um, Maser, please. So, when it comes to advancements in cell and gene therapies, where uh, is the foundation uh, uh, in that? Uh, what do you think about this? And how do you look at the opportunities uh, in translating research to European competitiveness? Thank you. 
Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for the great introduction. Incoming sounds like a kind of mail, <laughs> but uh, uh, I'm very happy to be here to uh, talk to you about how we in the foundation can contribute to reach the high ambitions and the position that we heard about earlier when it comes to Sweden's position. And we do that through promoting uh, research and also innovation. So, uh, as you heard, I work for Knut and Elis Wallenberg Foundation. And Knut and Elis Wallenberg Foundation is one of the largest private funders of research in Europe uh, in the areas of medicine, technology and science. We work in different ways in the foundation. So, uh, one main uh, area for us is supporting excellent researchers in basic research, and that we do through individual grants and project grants. And the other uh, part is that we work with strategic programs, strategic grants in areas where we think it's super important for Sweden to step forward, increase the efforts in research and competence building for Sweden to be successful. And of course, life science and these areas are one of the strategic areas. And I will come back to that. Uh, the foundation is a little bit more than 100 years old, so it was started in 1917 by Knut and, and Elise Wallenberg. They put their fortune into the foundation. And in the statutes, it said that the, the objective for the foundation is to be landsgangnelia. And it's an old Swedish word that means for the betterment of Sweden. So we work for the betterment of Sweden by supporting basic research and also supporting innovation that comes out of that research. In doing this, we have five uh, guiding stars for, for what we do. The first one is basic science or fundamental science. So we do not support applied research, we support basic research. We do that in a long-term way because we think it's necessary for the researchers to have time to plan and reach the results that they want to result and uh, they want to reach. And the main, uh, uh, main uh, way to do that is by having long-term grants. So typically five plus five years. We uh, believe in freedom, which means that we leave a lot of freedom to the researchers that we support once they get the grant. And they get the grant in very high competition, and it's evaluated by international evaluators. But once they get the grant, we do not hang over their shoulder and pick on exactly what they do. It's, we think that to get the most out of this, the person that is most skilled to do that is actually the researcher or the scientist themselves. We build competence for Sweden. Uh, in two different ways. Uh, we attract researchers, professors to Sweden and give them great opportunities to conduct their research in Sweden. But we also have huge graduate schools where we educate PhDs. And last but not least, we also support innovation. And I will come back to how we do that later on. So individual grants, different forms. We have the Wallenberg Academy Fellows. Those are young uh, researchers that we offer great opportunities to start building a research team in Sweden. Five plus five year grant. 60% uh, of them have a PhD degree that has come from outside Sweden. And now we are close to 50% women, between 40 and 50% women, which we're extremely happy about. The Wallenberg scholars are very senior. Uh, professors, and they also get long-term grants, five plus five years, and the freedom to conduct the research and continue to build strong research environments in Sweden. We have a specific programs for clinical scholars where that is targeted towards uh, researchers that also work clinically part of the time to get the connection between uh, clinical activities and also the research activities. We support projects, as I said, and one of the, the main projects, the biggest projects that we have supported is the Human Protein Atlas. And I think many of you are perhaps familiar with that project. And then we have the strategic grants in areas where we start strategic programs to build competence, long-term competence in Sweden, together with Swedish industry and also with Swedish public sector. So individual grants, today more than 700 uh, researchers, scientists in Sweden have support from us in different ways. Around 350 in projects, 230 Wallenberg Academy Fellows, those are the young ones, and 100 scholars, the very senior ones, and 24 clinical scholars. All of them evaluated in very uh, tough international uh, uh, competition, but also get long-term grants once they have the grants. 
Strategic programs. This is where we build competence for Sweden large scale. And these programs typically run at least for 10 years. And we currently spend more than 13 billion Swedish crowns in supporting these programs for the coming 10 years. The areas that we have for the strategic programs are areas where we have decided that for Sweden to be long-term successful, for the betterment of Sweden, Landsgangdelit, we need to build more competence and more research and strengthen our scientific quality in these areas. So that is how we have selected the areas. They are grouped into four clusters. So the blue cluster is around computer science, AI, quantum computing, mathematics, also, the green cluster is around material science. So it's uh, the Wallenberg Initiative Material Science for Sustainability and the Wallenberg Wood Science Center. And the red cluster is the cluster around life science, where we have our data-driven life science program. We also have SciLife Lab, Human Protein Atlas, Wallenberg Center for Molecular Medicine. If you add all of these programs together, uh, we have graduate schools with more than 1,300 PhDs. So that's quite an injection of competence into Sweden. At least 325 of those shall be industrial PhD students, which is the person that is employed by a company, but spends at least 80% of the time studying for a PhD at the university. Same setup for postdocs, 600 postdocs, 120 of those industrial postdocs. We are building research arenas together with industry, where industry joins forces with the academic researchers, and industry provides uh, in-kind time, but also equipment, systems, technology, platforms, and opens up for the academic researchers to do research on that platform, in that arena. And of course, since uh, our main ambition is to be Landsgangnelia, we want the vast majority of the people that we educate in these programs to find new positions in Sweden. Some of them in Swedish academia, but many of them in Swedish, uh, Swedish companies or in Swedish society. So let's look a little bit more into the life science, the red cluster there. Um, we have a long tradition in supporting life science research in Sweden. It's more than 25 years that we have supported life science uh, research. And with a total of uh, 710 million euros, so it's quite a lot of money as well. Some uh, main projects, the Human Protein Atlas, our Centers for Molecular Medicine, Center for Protein Research. We have Centers for Forest and Plant Bi Biotechnology. We have supported SciLife Lab uh, heavily. And we have the clinical scholars that I talked about, but also our uh, fairly recent, uh, recently started program on data-driven life science. SciLife Lab, I'm sure many of you are very familiar with SciLife Lab, but it's a national infrastructure for life science and life science research. And uh, even though it it's, was from the beginning centered around Stockholm and Uppsala, we now have nodes uh, on several sites in, in, uh, in Sweden. So we have Umeå, Gothenburg, Lund, Linköping, and of course then Stockholm and, and Uppsala. Centers for Molecular Medicine, it's a program that we started 2015 and it will run until 2028. Intention is to collaborate between healthcare and industry and academic research. So it's all together 87 research groups. And it's a lot of focus on transla transla translational research projects. Um, so also SciLife Lab is part here, but we have Umeå, Linköping, Lund, and the University of Gothenburg, each of them with slightly uh, different focus, uh, focusing on specific topics. The Human Protein Atlas uh, is a main resource for uh, precision medicine and advanced diagnostics, and it was started in 2003 by Professor Matthias Ullén, who began working mapping all of the proteins in the human body. And all of the data that they have gathered is open source, so it's available for everyone. And Matthias himself said that the aim is that better diagnostic methods will shorten the time to treatment and also be then uh, the soil for more advanced treatments. Data-driven life science is a program that we started in 2019 because we saw that the merge of data science coming into life science research is actually a totally new paradigm. And 
with the strength that we have in life science research in Sweden, as well as our strength in AI through the WASP program, Wallenberg AI Autonomous Systems and Software Program, we think that we can do something unique in this area in Sweden. The program focuses on four areas. So we have cell and molecular biology, evolution and biodiversity, infection biology, and of course then precision medicine is one of the four main topic areas in the program. What we do is we attract new uh, excellence to Sweden. We attract new researchers to come, international talents to come to Sweden. We train the next generation in the graduate schools and in the postdocs. We want to build this bridge between life science and data science and create a national data framework. And we also have um, from the foundation ensured that there is a computational infrastructure to run all of this in since we have financed Berzelius, Sweden's newest supercomputer in, at the National Supercomputer Center in Linköping that is available for researchers in these programs. In a bit more detail in data-driven life science, at least 40 new research teams will be established in Sweden. More than 500 PhDs and postdocs altogether develop models, methods, software. And it's a national effort, so it's a national program, national ecosystem in the area of life science. And also collaborating then both with industry as well as with healthcare and the private sector. Before I close, I want to say some words on innovation. Uh, we are a non-profit foundation, which means that we cannot engage in commercial activities. We're not allowed to do that. But what we can do is support our researchers with the proof of concept research grant. And that we do from the foundation. Uh, so from all of these programs and from all of the researchers that are in any way funded by Knut and Elis Wallenberg Foundation, they can apply for a proof of concept grant. Uh, we call that platform VALP, Wallenberg Launchpad. And through VALP, if you are approved, you can get a grant to do a proof of concept, build a minimum viable product, or do a research validation of your idea. So taking it just from an idea, the innovation goes from an idea into being something that you can show to potential investors. From the foundation, we cannot work with the investments since, as I said, we're not allowed to engage in commercial activities. But fortunately, we have companies within the Wallenbergs where that can. So if the researcher is interested in also a commercial investment in the company, that can be handled through our Navigare company, both with seed investments and also with further on in Navigare Ventures. And as you can see on the list here, we have quite a few companies that are exactly in the area of uh, advanced treatments and advanced diagnostics like cancer mutation detection, cancer therapy, cancer diagnostics, neuro-inspired AI algorithms. And those are all companies that Navigare uh, has invested in and they come out of the research that we have financed. But of course, since uh, every researcher in Sweden owns their own innovation, it's up to each researcher to do whatever they like. But if you, they want to, they can apply for financing from Navigare. So once again, thank you for inviting me and giving me this opportunity. And I hope that you now have a little bit better idea on how we from Knut and Elis Wallenberg support both research and innovation in Sweden to reach our high ambitions and our vision. Thank you. I have a small question for you. Ah. <laughs> uh, I was uh, thinking about uh, all of your efforts. It's uh, very impressive uh, in Sweden. I, I was wondering how you are thinking about international collaboration. Is that something that you require from the researchers? Because we in the ATMP field see that uh, the, it's often um, medicines for very small uh, diagnosis. So you need actually international collaboration. So I was wondering how you are uh, look upon that. Yes, uh, it's a very good question. Yes, we work with in international collaboration and we encourage international collaboration. By our statutes, we're limited to funding research in Sweden at Swedish universities. But we have international collaboration partners that we do collaborate with from the foundation. And also all of the researchers that we do fund are encouraged also to work, work with the best in the world to bring science forward. Mm -hmm. and it's very important. Of course, we had 
we're not limited to what we can do within Sweden, but financially we're limited to what we can support financially in Sweden. Mm. And these big infrastructures, are they for Swedish researchers only? To, pr to uh, um, boost the development? No, not entirely. Oh. Uh, we are, for instance, supporting Max4, and I think Max4 has mm, a lot of international, international scientists mm. coming there as well, that's so not true. entirely. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay, with that, I would like to thank you once again. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so for the next speaker is Lucy Ellerker. Uh, please uh, um, come up to the podium. So uh, Lucy Elker Jones is a patient advocate and a founder of the Opie Jones Foundation. And we have heard here before from uh, both uh, Sarah and Jim uh, about her efforts to speed up translation uh, of research into transformational therapies. And uh, I was wondering now, Ms. Elker, your son Opie was diagnosed with uh, leukemia uh, at only five months month of age. So please, can you share your story with us and also uh, tell us why it's so important uh, for patients to get fast access to these in uh, innovative therapies? Thank please. you. <laughs> so yeah, uh, my name is Lucy Elica Jones. I'm Opie's mum and the founder of the Opie Jones Foundation. Um, I wanted to share our story of Opie's journey to CAR-T um, and why we set up our foundation, which is inspired by him. So my husband, Lewis, and I have five children between us, and Opie is our only boy. He was born in the pandemic in May 2020. He was a relatively healthy baby, um, and we navigated life together in the pandemic. <laughs> In October 2020, our world came crashing down when we were told that Opie had leukemia. He had a high-risk blood cancer that chemotherapy alone would not cure. We knew within a week of Opie being diagnosed that he would need a bone marrow transplant. We were also told at this point that CAR-T was available only if he relapsed. Opie had four months of chemotherapy and immunotherapy to get him to bone marrow transplant while we waited for a donor who was eventually found in America. He had his bone marrow transplant in February 2021. We were in the hospital for five weeks, which is relatively short for a bone marrow transplant. There was a child next door who had been in hospital for 12 weeks. That time, OP didn't leave the room. He had no fresh air on his face or sunlight, and I was allowed to leave for an hour where I'd go for a walk. He was quite poorly. He had mucositis, and he needed to be on TPN uh, to help uh, with his feeds. We took him home and celebrated his first birthday and we thought all was well. He was 100% donor. He went to have his central line removed, which had been his lifeline for that time, and they did a lumbar puncture and found 0.2% leukaemia, which meant his bone marrow transplant had failed. And again, our world came absolutely crashing down. We were told that his last and only chance was to have CAR-T therapy. We had to meet with the palliative care team, which no parent should ever have to do. We went to Great Ormond Street for four days for him to have his T cells harvested, and they were sent to America to be manufactured into his super CAR T cells. This took four weeks, and because of the aggressiveness of Opie's leukemia, he did become quite poorly over that time. This is Opie after his bone marrow transplant. This was about a week after his bone marrow transplant. Um, these pictures, to me, kind of really show the difference between how poorly Opie had been. You can see he has no hair, and he's uh, had his NG tube in, um, and 
he was very poorly because of how aggressive the chemotherapy had to be for his leukemia in the conditioning in the run up to it. Whereas after his CAR T therapy, because his, the chemotherapy was only a small bit to make room for his CAR T cells, he's got hair, he had an NG tube for about a day until he pulled it out and they said he didn't need it anymore. Um, we, he, we spent about three weeks in hospital in Great Ormond Street for him with his CAR T and, um, and then we're home and he, yeah, we had our little Opie back and our little family was complete again. I think as time has gone on, Lewis and I have really wondered why did our baby have to go through all of that toxic aggressive treatment when there was such a kind of treatment available from the beginning? So we know that all children are different and all treatments work differently for each child, but surely our children deserve to have the kinder, less toxic treatment first. This is Opie now, this is, was on his third birthday and next month he is two years cancer free because of CAR T. He's a strong-willed, happy little boy at preschool. He loves books and does everything he should be doing at three years old. Keeps me on our, my toes. <laughs> we set up the Opie Jones Foundation so we could help share Opie's story far and wide to raise awareness of childhood cancer and the importance of earlier access to approved cell and gene therapies like CAR T. We want to support families with funding for activities that help their emotional well-being. Lewis and I know firsthand that life after childhood cancer diagnosis is devastating and after treatment, finding a new normal is really, really hard. We were apart for seven and a half months in total for OP's treatment, from diagnosis to getting home after CAR T. Every part of us as a family life as we know it had changed. So please help us with our mission, visit our pages and share. And if you'd like to help, please do get in touch. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for sharing and for letting us understand uh, why we are in this field and why it's so important for, for patients so to be important. in the center of all the development. I was uh, uh, wondering uh, if you would s send a message to uh, one message to people developing a new ATMPs, what, what, what would that be the um, most important? Thank you that the work they're doing in developing these new treatments is amazing. It saved Opie's life without a doubt, and it brings a new hope for children who are diagnosed with cancer. Mm. Were you uh, worried to get this uh, treatment, which you didn't know so much? I mean, to, uh, there has been CAR-T around for some time, but uh, uh, the risks are not maybe so uh, well known. Uh, what were your thoughts on that? Um, I think by that point, we would have had anything to mm. save our little boy. Mm. And it's only afterwards finding more ab out about the therapies. And uh, I think we're quite cross that he wasn't offered it first. <laughs> mm. 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 Yes, thank you very much for that and give a big applause. Thank you. Uh. We've heard uh, four different perspectives and, and also uh, uh, something that clearly puts us in the context why we're here, what, why we're doing this, all of this. But I'd like to uh, ask uh, Mark Battaglini, if, uh, the research, head of research for, um, or chief safety officer for the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine. Uh, Mark is uh, residing in the United States and uh, will give us a, a bit of perspective from another viewpoint, uh, how competitive are we in Europe? So please, Mark. Thank you, Doug, appreciate it. Um, I'm not sure how you follow that talk. Um, I've been in this industry now for seven years, and I think Lucy's uh, discussion today about her son just reinforced that uh, I made the right choice in the career path. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit first before I go into my presentation. Just going to give you a, a, a background a little bit about 
uh, about ARM. We're the leading international advocacy organization uh, in the cell and gene therapy space. We have almost 500 uh, members uh, spanning about 12, uh, 25 uh, countries. We have roughly about 140 uh, members based in Europe and about 10, I believe, are based here in, in Sweden. And it's made up of patient organizations, uh, developers, of course, think tanks, um, research institutions and the like. It's a very diverse organization. Uh, and our focus really, if you boil it down to, uh, is on two aspects. One is achieving patient access and the other is enabling uh, the development of advanced therapies. Um, when I uh, first started at ARM just a few months ago, I, uh, I had a chance to per participate in a uh, function by The Economist. Uh, in Brussels, and it was uh, it was stated by the moderator, who was a uh, writer for The Economist, that um, they thought that the advances in cell and gene therapy w equated to uh, the elimination, worldwide elimination of smallpox in the 50s and 60s. That's a pretty powerful statement. Um, and in Europe, you have a rich history as well. Um, 2012, Glybera was introduced uh, in Europe. Um, you have a number of milestones that have been achieved. Uh, you have a drug for uh, hemophilia uh, that was approved in 2022 by BioMarin, the de developer, before it was even introduced uh, in the United States. Um, you have a number of CAR T's that were approved both uh, uh, last year and again, Mr. Myers Scribbs CAR T was introduced and approved uh, in May of this year. And Europe may be the first uh, jurisdiction to approve a gene editing platform in Vertex's and CRISPR's um, uh, sickle cell drug. And in a number of these areas also, just to make note of this, and I think this is very important, is that the developers of cell and gene therapy are really focused on areas that have a huge cost burden. Uh, I, mentioned, I, I mentioned sickle cell. Sickle cell cost burden, the life of a patient is estimated to be between four and six million dollars. And the reason why it's even that low is life expectancy for sickle cell patients is only about 42 years. Um, for, for hemophilia A, the cost burden to the system is roughly uh, $21 million for the life of a patient. So these are significant uh, savings that are gonna be added to the, um, the, the system. Um, but at the same time, um, there are some dark clouds that are hitting Europe as far as the gene and cell therapy area is concerned. Um, roughly uh, only three of the phase one clinical trials in 2022 um, were initiated in Europe, and that's 1% of all phase one clinical trials. Um, Dr. Peter Marks, uh, who runs the US FDA CBER division, which is our division that reviews cell and gene therapy, made a statement a few months ago saying that by 2025, uh, he believes that his department will be reviewing anywhere between 10 and 20 applications in cell and gene therapy sector. That's roughly six times as many that will be reviewed in Europe in the same period of time. And then we have areas of uh, commercial challenges as well, and this is uh, a bit of a personal issue for me. Um, out of the 25 AT AMPs that were approved over the past few years, seven had been withdrawn from the market. Uh, one of those was with a company, I was with Bluebird Bio, where we were trying to get uh, approval uh, in Germany for a beta thalassemia drug. Beta thalassemia is a rare, rare disease. Um, that has uh, probably more of a prevalency in Greece and Italy, um, but we were unable to get the German authorities to have a meeting of the minds on what the value proposition was. So not only did we, uh, we're not able to assess and maintain and launch uh, as Integla, which is the beta thalassemia drug in Europe, but we had to pull out completely. We had to lay off roughly 150 uh, employees, um, 
And, and not only is it painful for that aspect, but it's painful for the fact that uh, the patients in Europe were not going to be able to get Zintaglo or Skysona, which was another drug for an ultra rare disease for angioleukodystrophy. One of the things I'm hoping that will come of this discussion, and Doug, I think, touched on this a little bit in the, his opening statement, is that I think we have to realize that ATMPs uh, are, are different. <laughs> Um, the development is different. Um, how it is researched is, is clearly different. Um, we are, you know, we, we have smaller clinical trials and that nature is the vast majority uh, of the disease states that we're in are in rare or ultra rare, and hence the, by nature the clinical trials are gonna be smaller. Um, we have to deal with single arm study with no placebo or, or active competitor, comparator. And the reason is, is when you're dealing with these deadly diseases, um, you can't have a placebo involved. It's unethical. Uh, and, and also, there's an issue uh, around durability or the lasting effect of the drug. Um, the durability that we are exhibiting is anywhere from four to seven years, um, based on that's the effectiveness over time that we can prove. Um, so it, it's, it's a completely different ballgame when you're looking at the assessment of ATMPs or cell and gene therapies. Uh, Uneta uh, on 21 um, is uh, basically, I think, probably going to be the guidelines of where the coordinating group is going to be going initially. Um, and you know, that 21 basically requires randomized control studies with a placebo. And when we as ARM looked at this and took the original 18 ATMPs and assessed what the impact would be with United 21's uh, type of assessment, um, roughly 16 of the 18 drugs uh, would, would not have gotten um, a favorable ruling. It would basically have been assessed that there would be no adequate data to advance the product for market authorization. Um, and that's concerning for a lot of reasons. Um, if you look at the, the, the disease states that would have been impacted by this, um, many of these are rare diseases. And, and as most of you know, if not all of you know, that uh, you know, of the 7,000 rare diseases that exist, uh, only 5% have treatments right now. So um, the, the current situation um, uh, on that we're looking at needs to be looked at differently. There has to be a reassessment of how we're going to be looking at things. And precedence is already being set, quite frankly. Uh, TLV, NICE, uh, GBA, Haas are all showing flexibility in what needs to be done in areas of the reviewing of ATMPs compared to what their UNEDA recommendations are. So I think we have to have an, a meeting of the minds on the discussion has to change. Um, we have, when this report came out, uh, we had a number of patient organizations, including the uh, Every Life Foundation, uh, come forward and say that this, this is alarming data and, and, and things have to be changed as far as what and how we look at the value assessment of ATMPs. It's a fundamental rethink, essentially, of what needs to be done to assess and develop uh, a fit-for-purpose methodology. So th this is the starting point that I think we need to have, stakeholders need to have regarding how do we look at ATMPs in a different way. The, the other issue that uh, the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine is, is looking at is we have a once in the generation opportunity to future proof uh, our system here in, in Europe in a significant way, in a scientific progressive way. And that's through the European uh, Pharmaceuticals legislation. Um, I went back and I took a look at the initial hospital exemption directive back in 2001, and, and the language says that it applies only to customer-made ATMPs used in a hospital setting for individual patient use, and such products must be produced at the request of a physician. The original hospital exemption was the lifeline to many, many patients, uh, and, and it, it's still in concept 
is a incredible gift to many patients who are facing uh, death or disability. But what we are seeing as an industry is, is a number of, of countries are going beyond that, looking at broader audiences, uh, looking to grant uh, hospital exemption status even when ATMPs are on the marketplace. So we are seeking guardrails and, and looking for other stakeholders to help us echo this. Uh, as it applies to cases where only authorized ATMPs or clinical trials should be in place. Um, there has to be a consistent interpretation, especially of the understanding of what is non-routine basis means. Uh, and there should be a, a mandatory public registry that needs to be in place. Um, the the, the non-harmonization that is occurring right now in Europe regarding uh, hospital exemption is gonna be challenging for assessing clinical data and looking at long-term follow-up. So again, this is something that we as an industry, as an association are moving forward to talk to stakeholders. Um, the purpose of me being here really to set up um, two really important panels. Um, I, I call it once in a generation discussions of very important issues. Uh, and I'm, pro I'm probably going to hear back from the panelists about the titling of that. Uh, but I, I think it's important that we, we really embrace kind of what the exchange is going to be and the expertise that are going to be brought to bear as it relates to both the pharma legislation and the hospital exemption issue, uh, as well as what we discussed about earlier regarding the joint clinical assessment. So it is a privilege to, to be here. I, I, I can't thank you enough for the invitation. Jim, thank you very much for co-hosting this event with us. Uh, and Doug, thank you. So Mark, maybe one, one uh, follow-up question if you... Sure. Uh, so um, uh, you, you paint a, a bleak picture of Europe or potentially a bleak picture. Uh, uh, what's the most important thing we should do in order to regain some competitiveness? Because I believe we do have the basic research uh, to stand on, but then the translation. You do. And, and I think the answer is dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's important that we have an opportunity to sit down with the necessary authorities to talk about and educate um, what has to be done differently, perhaps, in the approach to ATMPs. Um, I, I, I think there's opportunities here to make the situation better or make it even, you know, assess it in a different way. Um, I think there's just needs to be more dialogue in this regard. All right. Well, thank you. I think you have done a great job in terms of introducing the next two parts of this uh, session. And while changing scene a little bit uh, uh, and in, uh, inviting the, the, the panel then to the, to the floor, to the, st to the stage, uh, I think you should take that opportunity to stand up just to get a leg stretch or something like that. Uh. Is it free seating of the panel? I panelist? think so. Yeah. <laughs> So please, mm -hmm. uh, you can uh, uh, join us at the stage then, Just please. Approach. <laughs> Don't be shy. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's free as seating. aside from the two end seats, it's free seating for you. Uh, no, no particular <laughs> order, no pecking yeah. order, really. Uh, <laughs> I think Mark did a good job in also introducing, uh, in his last comment then, please, uh, the, um, the need to have dialogue. And I, I'm, uh, I think, uh, we kind of, it's almost like an afterthought, but we do have a nice uh, um, um, arrangement here with, with, sure. with the purpose of having a dialogue. So, Shastin. Mm -hmm. Yes, so, so we are very happy to open the first uh, panel discussion, uh, which will then focus on the revision of the uh, European pharmaceutical legislation. And as many of you know, uh, the European Commission proposed a new package uh, uh, of regulatory um, 
um, package of regulatory things <laughs> a couple of months ago. <laughs> and this package aims to renew uh, the EU pharma legislation. Uh, which has been in existence for uh, a couple of decades. And the ambition, ambition with this new uh, legislation is to uh, modernize, uh, modernize the regulatory framework and make it fit for purpose for new types of medicines. And as such, the package, package offers a unique opportunity to address uh, the declining competitiveness of Europe in the ATMP sector and also to bring back Europe in a leading position. So in this panel we will discuss whether the European Commission's proposal uh, are fit for purpose uh, for this goal or not. So in the panel we have first uh, fr from, from that end uh, uh, Dr. Bjorn Eriksson, a physician cardiologist but also former uh, director of the region Stockholm's healthcare, but, but now since a couple of years ago, the director general for the Swedish Medical Products Agency. And then we have uh, Anna Sandström, whom is a, a senior director of science and policy at AstraZeneca, Europe, I think, and not only Sweden. Uh, so welcome. And also then uh, uh, Jan Lecam, chief executive officer at Eurordis. You have to explain what Eurordis is for the, for the rest of us uh, in a bit. And, uh, and also so Miguel Forte, uh, president-elect at the International Society for Cell and Gene Therapy, uh, or ISCGT, as a mouthful. Uh, and uh, we'd like to um, kind of give you a little bit of a round of introductory comments and then have a, a common discussion. So I'll, I'd start with you, Bjorn. Um, uh, you're a, a, the head of a, a lead a national uh, regulator. We, I'd like to believe I'm Swedish too, so I'd like to believe that the MPA is, is important in the European scene. Uh, but you are a particularly well positioned to, um, uh, to assess how this uh, existing regulatory framework works and what needs to be fixed or addressed given the fact that, that science and technology evolves around us. Uh, and this includes, of course, then ATMPs and the science that we have uh, talked about uh, earlier here. Um, what do you see, see as particularly successful in this? And, and uh, what, what, is, what are the shortcomings, if I start that way? Thank you, Doug. Uh, the um, new regulation, the old regulation was from... Uh, 07, 2007, about ATMP. And uh, that set out for the first time a harmonization of the rules and how to be transparent with uh, all data and also uh, set a process for uh, approvals. Uh, so um, I think uh, it was really good, not at least for patient safety, that we had a common uh, process and a common legislation for for ATMPs. So, but it's old. It's from 07. Um, what are the shortcomings? You could see it presented. It's not many ATMPs uh, approved uh, right now. We are talking a lot about ATMPs, but the volume and the number of ATMPs are are low. And uh, I will discuss uh, further about the uh, hospital exemption, of course, but um, we have um, also had difficulties during uh, these years uh, with uh, delays, a slow approval process, uh, a lot of uh, time, uh, timelines for the approval uh, process. The uh, national competent authorities has had to use a lot of resources due to a quite complex uh, process and uh, system. And um, despite uh, the intention 07 to uh, have a, a availability for, for all, there has been quite limited availability of ATMPs because a small number, and, and we really need to, to enhance this. And, and we have lost in competitiveness, of course, in, in, in Europe. So um, we also lack from, from the old um, uh, regulation uh, the post-marketing uh, surveillance factor. So we really need to add that. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Sometimes, uh, sometimes, obviously, these are narrow patient populations, and you have the uh, single arm studies and so forth, and you have conditional approvals. Are we good in Europe in terms of uh, fulfilling the requirements for conditional approvals in this in this particular area? What do you th what do you say? Uh, I think it's um, quite good. Uh, we talked uh, earlier today about uh, the importance of uh, uh, facilitate uh, the uh, rate, uh, the speed of science and not uh, hinder uh, anything. So um, uh, we have to do adaptations. The, the solutions is adaptation. That means stepwise uh, working. Conditional approvals is one uh, stepwise thing of seeing it due to the fact that we really need to have entirely new ways of doing the benefit risk estimations and assessments. So, and that depends on uh, the um, evidence generation that is uh, in methodology quite different from now. We have single arm uh, clinical trials, we have other ways of looking at outcomes, and then we have to be quite sure that it's effective and that it's safe. So we have to learn all the time, and that's why uh, conditional approvals could be an opportunity. Okay, I think we'll talk more about that, <laughs> that uh, in a bit. So, Kerstin. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Jan, uh, we have heard from Björn about some of the areas for possible improvements in the EU regulatory uh, framework. Uh, and um, uh, from the patient's point of view, which are the elements of the European Commission's proposal that you welcome and which, are, uh, which could be improved? And also, perhaps, a bit about your orders. <laughs> okay, so yes. maybe your orders in few words. Uh, we bring together the patient's organization of rare disease from all over Europe for the 48 countries. So over 1,000 patient organizations are members. And thanks to that, we're able to speak on behalf of 30 million patients at the European level to, in order to stimulate policies such as regulation, but also organization of healthcare or research programs or social activities. The, and we are engaged, in fact, in practice within the scientific committees of the EMA and into scientific advice every month, also involved into HTA. So we very much into the practice of the, of the thing. So what this new proposal brings, we believe, um, is that there is an attention given to the unmet medical needs. So there is an ambition to attract investment where there is the unmet medical needs rather than me too product, to say it that way. So the intention, at least, is, is, is good. The second thing from the perspective specifically of the community of rare disease is that the proposal as it is, is a good positioning for rare diseases. While when you look back four or five years ago, the trend of the discussion with seven member states against the orphan drug regulation and wanted to completely disregards the incentives was really a bad starting point. So we've come a very long way, I think, with a positive outcome to get there. Now, the specific elements which are positive are the inclusion in the regulation of new dis process, like the prime designation, for instance, so to support the development of breakthrough with more advice and uh, rolling on uh, uh, support to the product development and acceleration of review, etc. So that's positive. We see also as positive the inclusion and more importance given to real world evidence, the presence of the very early dialogue, which I hope we'll go back to because that's really an essential, an essential uh, element. The modulation of incentives, we have promoted it. Uh, we developed it with the stakeholders, with the academia, the industry, uh, to, to, to look at what type of incentives could be promoted. And the sandbox also is interesting. And the last point probably is the fact that all the decision makers, making process is accelerated, which is good and makes us a bit more competitive with the US. Now, what I, we can really regret is overall a lack of ambition and a lack of narrative from a perspective on why this new proposal, this new legislation, will really address the fact that we progressively losing ground and falling behind US and China, particularly in the TMPs, but more broadly. 
And really, the narrative is not very strong. We have the impression that it's a compromise of many different influence or influencers, but at the end, is that a coherent system? Are we really prepared with that for the next 20 years? Because we're not going to change it five or 10 years from now. So we're really worried about that, that in fact, there is politically at the European level, even a lot of policymakers in the European Commission and in some member states who don't believe that Europe should be a world leader in the development of new therapies, but just a follower. And we need to clarify that. Mm -hmm. Because if not, the direction that was just indicated is just going, going to aggravate. Mm -hmm. So that's really our main concern. Then we have other specifics, but I will not go into that. Is it true that, uh, like uh, we heard from the minister, that the, the sum of all these small good intentions is problematic? Is that a, a good discussion? Yes, it's exactly. It's another way to say it. Is that is this sum of compromise doesn't make a fully consistent uh, text. So it, it there is a good there is good intention. It goes in the right direction, but from our perspective, it's too much inspired by healthcare and by and under the uh, microscope of the payers in particular uh, and not enough uh, with the perspective of EU competitiveness agenda, industry and research. And so that's for us what we're losing in, the, in this opportunity for the moment. Okay, I think we should bring back the order and, and uh, yeah, yes, uh, I'll allow uh, Chastin <laughs> to ask a question to the industry representative <laughs> here on the stage, so please. Yeah. I would just uh, uh, interesting to hear if you think that the incentives in other countries uh, or in other jurisdictions are better um, future proof than in Europe. So here we have a different perspective than industry on that. Uh, a lot of the reaction of the industry to this proposal has been that the data protection is being reduced in order to facilitate the entry of generics and biosimilars. That's what I meant, for instance, of having, doing this revision under the microscope of the, of the payers. So we understand that in terms of sustainability. But what we're saying as patient representative is that we observe that the data protection in Europe today is not less than in the US and still we're falling behind. So that's not the reason. Now, I fully agree with industry that reducing the data protection sends really the wrong message, <laughs> for sure. Uh, but it's not, it's not the core of the element to make us more competitive. So we believe that it's more by other proposals within the regulation, but also more by working also on the ecosystem, upstream on the research, downstream on the access, mm -hmm. that maybe we have our chances. For instance, the fact that there is only few phase one clinical trials on the TMP introduced in Europe. Is that really linked to data protection or market exclusivity? No, that's or research environment. How, how are we attractive or not? If I want to do an ATMP trial in the US on some of the rare disease, I go to the NIH clinical research networks and I can in few days identify the number of patients with a certain phenotype and genotype. And then it takes me a few weeks to do the recruitment. In Europe, it's gonna take months till now. And we are only discussing now the creation of these clinical research networks. And we get even confused about what they really should be when we have a pattern in the US just to apply mm. in addition to European funds network. So I think we have a difficulty. We, we, we don't scale up and we don't think in terms of industry and entrepreneurship in this area. We think too much research and scientific publication still now. Mm. Sorry to say. Interesting, thank you. <laughs> Uh, so, Anna, <laughs> uh, from the point of view then of industry, what do you see as the main hurdles uh, to get these ATMPs to patients? And how do you think that the revision of the pharma legislation will improve or, or not improve uh, uh, this? Well, I will add to the choir here when it comes to the spirit and the intention of the, the new pharma uh, legislation proposal here. Uh, so it's the right spirit. Um, focus on patient access to medicines, focus on European competitiveness. Um, I want to emphasize that uh, this area, ATMPs, will not have the same type of protection uh, when it comes to patents as uh, small molecule drugs, and that makes it a totally different ballpark. We really need the, the da regulatory data protection for that reason. And the innovator biologics in the US are 12 years, 
and uh, looking uh, at Japan, it's eight years and 10 years for orphan. Um, and in China, they are proposing 12 years for biologics uh, and all, uh, orphan and pediatrics. So it's clearly sending the wrong signals. Uh, we are very happy with the, the fact that they, there will be uh, an upgrading on the regulatory uh, system, including the shortened timelines that we are aiming for, including the sandbox, the regulatory sandbox initiative, etc. Um, but we are really uh, seeing that it risks uh, increasing the chilling of the European competitiveness in this space uh, that we are seeing when it comes to clinical trials going down, R&D investments increasing globally, but not in Europe from, from companies uh, to the same extent. And we see the, the timelines that we have today with uh, other countries and other regions being much faster in approval processes. Um, so there's a lot of things that this regulation needs to be helpful with and really show that it makes a difference. And the signals of reducing the data protection is not a good one. All right. Um, <clears throat> I, I bet you're uh, thinking about commenting on each other, but before we do allow, open up between you and then Miguel, uh, hospital exemption was mentioned earlier here, and, and it's also part of this uh, uh, although not not the core of the pharma package, but but still a part of the the um, was being considered for for updating in the in the regulation. Then, um, as mentioned here, this allows for for uh, uh, patients in need to to have access to treatment when it's manufactured in a hospital for a particular patient for his, uh, and so. But then there are other ideas around the hospital exemption that fl uh, is floating around in various parts of Europe and. What's your take on this? Um, so, just to put it in the context of the the review of the of the legislation, and, and I just address again the fact that there is a positive intention, but not a strong enough intention, and a series of balances uh, of trying to find managing different agendas. And hospital exemption is a clear example of that. If we go back to the beginning, uh, when hospital exemption was kind of created, was at the time of the first uh, uh, legislation, and it was a little bit of a kind of uh, steam valve. Um, and also because we couldn't fit everything in the same place, so it was created and was given an opportunity to member states to provide access to patients. Valuable proposition, access to patients, uh, but also in the context of the beauty of Europe, which is our diversity is our strength, but our diversity means also trying to get balances. Because it was that way, hospital exemption was then, in a way, misused. And I would say, with, with a good intention, but misused. In, in multiple different ways across member states and trying to reach potentially other objectives than the initial uh, intention. The initial intention was to provide an exceptional access with a risk-benefit assessment with limited information for a clear unmet medical need without an, uh, uh, an alternative option. And this is important because there was a risk-benefit assessment, so the regulators made a decision based on ensuring quality, or at least a certain guarantee of quality, and some assessment of, of safety. But then it kind of went in different ways, and we not only let it go in different ways, but we didn't register adequately what the experience was. And so currently, we're faced with the same problem. How do we deal with, this, with uh, the steam valve? And so. And, 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 the, and it, it, it's interesting because in the first part was a piece of the legislation and there was a lot of discussion. Now in the revision of the legislation, it becomes another piece of the legislation, again with a lot of discussion. And I would vouch that in the context of a very stagnating competition in Europe, uh, uh, 
which is very worrying. Um, and there's multiple factors to it, starting on investment, company creation. But the regulators are particularly relevant because the, the, the gatekeeper for the use before approval and after approval. So it's important that going forward, we stick to the principle of the right objectives of hospital exemption, which is exceptional use, limited numbers, uh, non-competing with regulatory approved uh, products, uh, making sure that uh, it is an exceptional for the patient need, but not an alternative to create a, a parallel regulatory track, which is going to, again, negatively impact on, on, on competition. And above all, going forward, monitor, register, and be transparent about it. So bottom line, there's a place for it, for the patient's sake, but needs to be used to prevent diminishing our competitiveness, because in the end, it will not be good for the patient in Europe if we diminish our competition in Europe. So I'd like, to, I'd like to open up then for comments uh, on, on each other. So we've obviously, as you kind of sensed, we've uh, asked s separate questions and it, it's not an intention to, uh, to al allow the panel not to talk to each other because of different topics, but it's rather the opposite to, to allow for a, an, an interesting discussion, hopefully then. Uh, so will we have an interesting, who'd like to start? Uh, who'd like to comment, uh, any of the, what, Bjorn, you look like you're... Uh, if I should say anything, it's um, I'm also very concerned about the competitiveness of the of the research landscape in Europe, and the, it's quite obvious that we really are declining when it comes to clinical trials, especially multinational big trials. But uh, when it comes to ATMPs, there are a lot in the pipeline. I know that Europe is quite uh, good and competitive. And we really need to foster the development of the ATP, not just uh, the idea and the start, but the entire product. And I'm also fully agree with that the hospital exemption, it is an exemption. It should be approved like everything else. But we have the possibility as regulators to do the exemption just to for, for the uh, potential to treat patients and, and for, the, for the health uh, potential and when we regard it as uh, effective and safe, of course. But uh, uh, the applications and how we will do it in the future are still a matter of negotiation. So we have a couple of years. This is the Commission's proposal and we have a couple of years to really discuss it a lot. But. Uh, yeah. I agree of, of uh, a lot of things that is uh, said here. Yeah, and I think we also suffer a bit from the various practices, uh, various ways of applying this across Europe. Yeah. So, so there is perhaps a need for also harmonization that can come in that, in yeah. that dialogue uh, on, on the proposal. Yeah. So. If I can make a comment, uh, I was actually resonating to what you're saying. There's a good intention on the legislation, which, which needs to be updated anyway. And the intention, even on the data protection and the changes in times, is to ensure that the products remain on the market, are launched and are used. But it's kind of looking at the final intention and not necessarily taking care of the steps to get there, right? Because I think anyone that develops a product wants it to be launched and used and serve the patients. So I think we need to consider that if we are protecting the launching and permanence on the market, we need to cater for the approval process and the reimbursement process in the right ways. Because if you want to keep them there, you have to allow them there. And I think that's the discussion in terms of the regulation, and that's the discussion in terms of the payment and, and access. And I share with you, I mean, we will not succeed in Europe if we wishy-washy, right? We need to be aggressive um, and all aggressive together to, 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 to achieve it. Yeah. I fully support all comments on the hospital exemption. We believe there is a place for hospital exemption, particularly for the long tail of the very rare disease, the one that we call the one in a million. 
And we see that constantly. There is few families, then usually there is one leader that appears, that then suddenly you realize there is five or 10, 15 patients in Europe, and that's all. And that's not going to attract investment of a company to do a therapy, but sometimes the technology is already there and could be applied. So there is a place for that kind of, of work from the hospital university, particularly as competence will grow. But should the issue of competing with the approved product is a real issue because that's, a strong, that's very confusing then. As, as an investor, you don't know in what you're investing. There is no protection. So we see that as an issue. The, but the reason, I'd like to go back to like the reason for failure when we see the seven withdrawn product, is that linked to data protection? Is that linked to, no. It's the issue, as you said, of access to the market. That's what we need to fix. And the regulation is not going to fix it. Not even with the measure of one more year of exclusivity if, if present in 27 member states, which particularly in the TMP is not a good measure because it's not the right thing. We don't want that the TMP to be in the 27 member states. We don't want the company to spend the money to go to 27 member states in 23 languages, etc. That's just nonsense. So there is other ways to, to, to do it. The, so we need to work on the real issues, which then are not automatically in the regulation, but can be outside. Now, within the regulation, part of the solution from more perspective is the very early dialogue, particularly on the TMPs. To have that very early dialogue at the EMA, involving also HTA, but with the clinicians, with the patients, with, the, with the, 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 the healthcare providers, so that we can really see what do we know, what is missing, and try to de-risk the development. And there is a mindset which at EMA exists, but which I don't see in that regulation, that we should be companion of success of the development of the medicines. I know the regulators and HTA need to keep distance with the interest of the developers, that's what I'm saying. But when you look at how prime functions of scientific advice at EMA, we're trying to help to succeed, right? But we need even more flexibility here, more fluidity, being proactive in the questions, making more suggestions on how to do it right. I have in mind a recent dossier at EMA where the company was drawn in the process of marketing authorization because at the end they were not, the data were weak, but because we missed all the opportunities in the scientific advice. So we need to, to guide the, for, to, for the quality, and for me it's an early dialogue and much more companion. So gatekeeper, yes, but also a helper to win in the development of the treatments. Uh, are we, are we uh, picking up speed in terms of regulatory approval in the ATMP area? In, in other words, learning, the company is, is, is learning, the, the, the regulatory agency is learning, and the, there is uh, advice and so forth. I, I, I saw last year uh, six new ATMPs being approved among 41 completely new, type, uh, new, new uh, product entities in, in, in the EMA approval. But then there is also another column in the same sheet which says a lot of withdrawn applications. What's hidden behind those? I don't know. But Bjorn, mm, I, I have not no answer on, on that. Yeah. But uh, I fully agree. But I think this new uh, proposal contains just the possibility for a sustainable infrastructure that we could develop the rules change assessment when methodology uh, change and that we have a great possibility to really do uh, what we need and not uh, just be rigid like the, mm. the, the first one. So I, I think this is a step. I, I can also hear that it's not a leap, it's a too small step in, in your eyes, but I think it's a step forward right to, f to foster the innovation that we really need and the possibilities of just having uh, conditional or small scale approvals just to test concepts and, and so in the future. So, so I, I can see it in, in, in a different way, actually. I, I think it's... Um, uh, for a regulation, it's quite uh, modern in so my eyes. So what you're eyes. saying, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 if I try to put it in layman's terms, it's, it's a, a regulatory system that doesn't say yes or no. It's, it yeah. says, let's try, try this and learn. And yeah. then, then also being confident that you can 
you can say no at a later stage if it doesn't yeah. work, which sometimes seems to be a problem. But uh, uh, in there, there is also a patient <laughs> perspective here. We we heard um, Lucy talk about uh, that very very clearly, and and and, and should the patients be part of this? What do you say? <laughs> yeah. uh, yes, uh, I, that's a question for you, for you, uh, Jan. Uh, so, so, uh, but that is for the um, uh, for the second panel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, but for for the assessment, I think that the patient might be more involved in the scientific advice, uh, maybe, uh, in order, uh, and also earlier during the whole um, um, product development, uh, probably, or all from basic research to 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 final approval in. in in uh, mm. every uh, country, uh, and uh, particularly maybe also in scientific advice, because to my experience, the, uh, the companies are learning uh, more, so that's why they are uh, getting better. I think few, uh, fewer products will actually withdraw mm -hmm. their products uh, because they are, uh, understand better how the regulatory framework uh, works. Uh, but in order to, um, uh, to do that, I think that the patients need to be more involved, and do you think this will happen in the new regulatory? Okay, so I mentioned that for us there is other weaknesses in that proposal, and the key one is particularly the, the participation of patients. It's Europe sometimes is really amazing. We have been pioneering in having patients in scientific committees of EMA with a positive outcome of that, involving them in scientific advice with scientific evaluation to show the benefit, involving them progressively all over the place in EMA. And now we revise the regulation, and in fact, we give a smaller place to patients into the regulatory system. That's what is in the proposal. It's still in the management board, still in the, now in the CHMP, which is new. But for me, it's like giving you a new tool to play, but then taking all your, the tools away. There is no guarantee. There is may be involved, not will be involved. And I'm really concerned because at the same time, EMA was ahead of FDA in terms of involvement of patients. And now FDA has really catched up. They're doing fantastic things like the patient focus groups. They are doing involving patients all over the place. So now they're becoming the champion of involving the patients and EMA is losing that, but that competitive advantage somehow. And we are not scaling up again that involvement of patients is still limited to one patient representative coming to scientific advice and not two because it's too expensive. And all that kind of stupidity, which is not aiming to quality outcome of the, of the, of the discussion. And now the fact that the regulation is a step back, I'm really concerned because the regulation on HTA also say may involve patients, but there is no guarantee on involvement of patients. So it's all depending on the willingness of the colleagues from the HT agency who are willing to do it today, but you don't know what it will be tomorrow and with what kind of practice. All the question of the conditions, for instance, on the competing interest, that's really the reason to get to do it well or to do it wrong. We see today already at EMA a lot of patient representatives not involved because of potential competing interest. Sure, when you are in a very rare disease, you're involved in all the research activities. That, that's not we confusing transparency, which is to declare your risk, with the fact that there is a lack of transparency. So, and the same for the medical experts. So, what I'm saying here is that if there is no guarantee of the involvement of patients in the regulation, then there is really no guarantee that it's going to happen in with good conditions. I don't intend you to put you on the, on the spot, Bjorn, but uh, you are, uh, and you are not the commission. It's not your pr pr proposal. So, but still, uh, any comments from from uh, yeah. from a regulator's point? Yeah. Point yeah. Of? Uh, I will let you in, Anna, soon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I think uh, having patients on board is crucial, of course. Uh, the new uh, proposal is first saying that we will have advice at all levels. Ideas, uh, developing the idea, uh, developing the product, everything. And we will have simultaneous uh, advice. We, we just uh, have this. But just in, in the advice, we don't have patience in the legislation. But as you say, still at the management board, and they are very active at the management board. Um, last Friday, we started the multi-stakeholder platform, trying to develop clinical trials. It's tremendous big patient participation in that. And I Jordis uh, was uh, one of the most important actors there. So I, I think 
we have a lot of things uh, that involves patients at, at all places, but maybe not in advice. Mm -hmm. And in the future regulation, <laughs> that's the point. <laughs> yeah. What but we're doing today is good at the EMA, there's no question yeah. about that. But for the future regulation, we need some guarantees here. Yeah. Experience shows when it's not guaranteed, you lose it. And, and the patients are important, of course, of in the science. beginning, for, because the scientific advice comes very early, uh, and it should come early, so the patient's view should be early as well, because otherwise uh, uh, many things can go wrong during the way, for example, choosing of uh, um, how to proceed with uh, developing programs yeah. and so on. So I think it would be beneficial, but I think it in, in these working groups that are um, going to uh, uh, be instead of the CAT committee, for example, okay. uh, I think uh, they, they will probably involve patients, but, but of course you're right, if it doesn't say uh, yeah. explicitly, they, they will not. Yeah. And we hear what you say, so take this in, into the negotiations, of course. Right. This is why Whoa. we have a panel. <laughs> <laughs> Anna, you've been wanting to, to, to say yeah, something. Yeah, and I was actually on a previous comment, uh, and I, I completely agree with, um, of course, we need to work in parallel with different areas in the European system in order to increase the competitiveness, working on the clinical trial systems, the 18P centers, uh, the infrastructure, also fueling R&D so we continue to to fuel the pipeline, uh, catalyzing collaboration between academia and industry. Such initiatives are also very important for the European competitiveness. But at the same time, the RDP change is negative now. It is a signal. And we are talking about future-proofing the system. And even though for the, the examples we see today, perhaps the RDP or the, the signals there weren't that important. But for the future, we don't know how it's going to be with biosimilars being able to be created uh, faster. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't know what the future... So we need to future-proof the system and then we need to stay competitive. Yeah. And that's not the same. When, when you look at the industry pipeline, though, where there is a lot of competition inbuilt, you have a, uh, areas where you have a number of competitors for the same target, the same disease definition, and, and so so same, same indication really. And 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 I I think uh, I think that's probably very good because then then you can have two outcomes: either there will be better products, or there will be competition in the market. So so uh, that should be welcome. Then obviously. Uh, it's up to each uh, investor or financier of, of, of each program to kind of determine the risk in that sense. Uh, so, but, but perhaps we have a uh, 10 minutes to more to go. Uh, a question from the floor. I, I think Lucy was first and then... Uh, so two, two short questions. Uh, is there a microphone somewhere? So because we're taping if, this. If, uh, so. not, if not, shout. Yes. Yeah, I, I can relay the question then, so please. That's, that's starting to be difficult to relay now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I got the gist of your question. It's uh, if you take a product, for instance, from Australia that is approved there in their system, how can we make that available faster in Europe and, and uh, consolidation? Or we obviously don't have that the mechanism for harmonization across different continents. So we, we have European perspective here, but it's, uh, is that a reasonable and well, well yeah, so please. Yeah. yeah. I, I will try to, to answer that. Um, in precision medicine, the world is a bit more complex and we need adaptation, we need harmonization, and we need a infrastructure that we develop and that is sustainable over time. Yeah. And I think harmonization 
it's hard even in between governmental authorities in Sweden. So uh, it is a hard job to do, but I think uh, we are in a good way of, of doing this with the new legislation and uh, Europe as a single market, what you uh, think about that, but it is the um, floor that we rely on and then we um, uh, have to, to do everything in a harmonized way. That means also transparent. So uh, the opportunities of sharing data in a new way sh uh, should be quite uh, sufficient to be much more ha harmonized than we are today. So at least, uh, let, at least let, the... let's uh, then Europe uh, against FDA, US FDA, Health Canada. We have uh, yeah. a lot of uh, corporations, but also with other parts of, of the world. So we have the, for regulators, the, the global uh, uh, ICMRA uh, work, which also discuss this type of questions. But, if but still, uh, this has been going on, on, on yeah. ongoing for quite a number of years, then uh, those mechanisms and, and exchange. But still, I have a sense, I don't know for a fact, but in this area, it's, we're starting to see some kind of a divergence, more products, more ATMP or cell and gene therapies being approved in the US than in Europe. Uh, yeah. Maybe it's, it's yeah. the business model, uh, the companies don't want to go here, I yeah. don't know, or is it, is it the regulatory hurdle, I don't know, or is it the HTA hurdle, uh, I don't I, know. I, I think there is a mechanism that if the gap will be too, too, too broad or, yeah. or big, uh, we will uh, adapt to that. So um, a crisis is quite, could be quite helpful sometimes. Uh, the pandemic learned a lot and also after right now we are working a lot with shortages and when working with shortages we really want uh, the regulations in India and China and Australia as like uh, the European uh, regulation as it can so that we can uh, certify and uh, use the uh, uh, medicines from, 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 from those countries. And, and it's the same with ATMPs. If the United States have a lot more and more effective treatment, I am sure that we will adapt. Any so, other uh, comments uh, from the China? Yeah, I, I wanted to make a, a, a couple of comments. One is, obviously, for it to get quick access, there must be a legal entity that actually does it there. And probably the fastest access is clinical trial. Right. It was my first knee reaction. Uh, and that clinical trial is, is going to provide um, access, but it's also going to provide well-documented ev evidence while the regulatory process takes place. And I, one of the things that we forgot about in the discussion here, and it's a, 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 somehow it could be an easier fix, is precisely the clinical trials. And your comment about uh, the pandemic is an important, <coughs> sorry, an interesting one, because there was temporary solutions that were taken for development during the pandemic that then were kind of dropped back. Actually, the GMO, for instance, is part of the new legislation, taking advantage of that knowledge. So things can be done when there is a need uh, and the, the, there is a will. And sometimes we should really just learn from that, those, those hang, low hanging fruits and implement. Making clinical trials faster, easier to do and generate the evidence, not only kind of gives you that opportunity, but will enable us to make the right risk benefit decision. Yeah, considering uh, we, we, it's almost like we, we're very pessimistic here. We, we think Europe is, is causing a lot of problems, but uh, isn't uh, GM, GMO an area where we actually are quite competitive? Uh, well, we can be. Well, I, I think I, I don't think that we should be kind of go away kind of uh, very sad and pessimistic. There's a huge opportunity, and I think it's, it's a call for action. And, and the GMO is, is, is clearly one example. It was, it's an, it was a very awkward situation that it was solved for now. It's now going to be solved, but for instance, should we have to wait until the legislation to come to have it done? We could potentially do it faster as we did, right? And, and so uh, I've said it before, I mean, just do it. I think everybody agrees. So why just don't we do it? So we do have the opportunity. There's multiple things. I think if we do all our bits, and, and the regulators are particularly important because they're the gatekeepers of right generation of evidence and the right decision, 
we need to make it flexible while still adequate uh, and, and accelerate. All right, thanks. Uh, the gentleman in the blue shirt. Thank you for calling me the man. <laughs> I, I said the gentleman. <laughs> One listens what we want. <laughs> So, so we have these um, uh, this advice sessions with the agencies, uh, uh, both in Europe and, and, and locally. Then, uh, uh, and then uh, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, so, Bjorn, uh, do you go back to those companies that um, uh, and ask them what their experience were and, and uh, use that as a learning for how to improve? Was that a reasonably well uh, interp good that, interpretation? That is a, a good yeah. Yeah. So is, uh, is there a, is I, there a, is there a translation? I'm, I'm sorry to to say that I recognize that weakness in in the process. So we are not so good at uh, the feedback, the learning in the society, and we are so um, eager to keep the integrity of the applicant. So we are not sharing to everyone, not even the applicant. So, so uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm really um, sorry for that. But I often hear that uh, th this can be improved. And uh, I promise I want to do what I can. But we are, we are trying at the entire yeah. agency and all agencies to be more open. And the pandemic, once again, showed us that also the citizens uh, really wanted the knowledge we had. So we have tried to be more open, but um, All right. I take this So, so it's a well-paced question. <laughs> we, we are being conscious of time then, and then yeah. I, I think we should use the last couple of minutes then to ask you four, the four of you, to, um, to, to identify the single most important thing that should be done in relationship to the, dis the upcoming discussion on the, on the regu uh, regulatory uh, or the le legislation proposal. What's the, uh, maybe Miguel, I'll, I'll start with you. The single most important that should be done now. I think it's, um, it's a collaborative, integrated, multiple stakeholders focus on access to market. So having these type of panels. Yeah, absolutely. And, 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 and if the, the biggest pressure point this, this is a chain of things. It starts with the investment and gets to the use. But I think the, the key element that will drive, because that's when patients start to get the benefit and all the stakeholders, is really the market access. And, and we, we, we need to do it collaboratively and in integrated, not only the different member states, but also the different stakeholders. Right. And the gatekeepers are the gatekeepers, and we should collaborate with them. So, Jan. I go back to someone earlier said, move the food to move the cat. So we've been proposing, <laughs> <laughs> we've been proposing along that maybe EU should send the message that we are inviting the companies to go to Europe first and to do clinical trials more in Europe. So we said in the context of market exclusivity to add one year of market exclusivity if you come to Europe first in mm. terms of application. But we could apply that more broadly to data protection and say, if you come to Europe first, I'll give you one year more of data protection or two years. I don't know, I'm very generous. <laughs> but the, you know, it's just to send that message to say, be serious, attract the people here. What are we, what are we telling them? For the moment, really. yeah, it's almost uh, paradoxical that uh, that uh, it's we, we hear that the United States is more kind of uh, coherent, and you can uh, you can go there and, and something happens. 
as opposed to, and, and, and then you have a completely fragmented uh, healthcare system, different payers, different uh, uh, arrangements. Here in Europe with socialized medicine, uh, it seems more fragmented. <laughs> that's, that's kind but of... We have assets, yeah. we have assets. We don't build enough, I think, on no assets. Yeah. Uh, the fact that the EMA has scientific committees rather than review division, that gives more consistency. Uh, the fact that we have only 27 healthcare system instead of 300 private healthcare yeah. insurance is also an asset. We just don't leverage them. Yeah. So, Anna. I would say emphasize and, and take into account and start the process of having more dialogue on the impact of the legislation mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to European competitiveness. Mm. Yeah. I, I agree on the wording collaborative multi-stakeholder approach and that we need to harmonize a lot of things. We need to harmonize academy, we need to harmonize uh, regulatory bodies, we need to harmonize industry in, in a lot of things. So uh, that we can do that before we have the sustainable infrastructure for the future. Because I think this will take three or four years until we have this. And the duration of the legislation will probably be about 20 years. So um, we, need to get it right. we, we shouldn't wait. Uh, what do you say, uh, Kerstin? Uh, mm, yes, final? I think it's uh, time now to uh, end this very interesting discussion. Uh, so I would like to thank all the panelists, uh, and we will give uh, the floor for the second uh, panel. Um, so we give the, a big applause for the panelists. Thank well, you. Thank you. So yet again, uh, use this opportunity to stand up and uh, get some kind of uh, blood flow in your limbs. <laughs> Thanks. So if we can ask the, um, the next panel then to uh, come up on stage. Good to see you. No, it's a bit laborious. The mic is open. <coughs> You can come. <laughs> so you're back? Yeah, 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 that's good, that's good. Mm -hmm. I can flip up on a stool, so it's a little bit more. Don't worry. We will keep track of time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I have, have a, pl a, pl a flight to catch. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Christine, would you like to? So I think we're ready. I think uh, we uh, we probably all uh, uh, ben benefit from from. Uh, get going and then uh, have, have this next session. We talked about um, uh, the uh, European legislation proposal, but there is also another uh, step uh, that a new uh, treatment has to go through, and that's the health technology assessment, or the, the question, is it worth the money, in a way, um, uh, in comparison to what we do already. Uh, and then, uh, so this discussion will be, this session, this panel will be about um, the, the specifics of um, the, uh, um, the plans and the, the decision to, to uh, have joint clinical assessment in, in across the European markets as well, which normally has been, or historically has been part of the national competency as opposed to the, to the, uh, the um, regulatory approval, which is a European competency area. Uh, we've, we've also heard that ATMPs are different, and, uh, and they come with some specific aspects when it comes to uh, HTA and, and joint clinical assessment. One of them is that sometimes that the, the, the one-off treatment with an expectation for a long uh, treatment effect, a long duration of treatment effect. 
and it seems like this is what we struggle about in terms of the uh, the healthcare system readiness and the willingness to to do do this. And we also heard from Mark Battaglini uh, that the uh, if you take the existing ATP products and uh, test them against the principles that are proposed in the this European uh, joint clinical assessment that it, it looks like it might be problematic. Uh, so that's, that's this kind of the scene setting for this. And mm -hmm. So once again, we are pleased to announce that we again have a very distinguished panel for this topic. So in the panel, we have Niklas Hedberg, uh, who is a co-chair of the EU Health Technology Assessment Coordination Group and chief pharmacist at the Swedish Government Pricing and Reimbursement Agency, TLV. And we have Francis Pang, I was a senior vice president and head of the global market access and geographic expansion at Orchard Therapeutics. And once again, once we had again. Jan Lecam, <laughs> and he's still the chief executive officer <laughs> at Geordis. Welcome. Uh, I don't look at the emails, but. <laughs> <laughs> so, Nicholas. Uh, uh, it's it's kind of natural to start with you, and, and you're fully aware that we intended to do that. So, uh, can you tell us a bit about the um, European Union Joint Clinical Assessment um, and how this is, tended, is intended to work for ATMBs? I believe it's from 2025 that has been the set ambition. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> Perhaps then starting with with. Uh, uh, making two actually two small corrections of things that has already been said. So, so uh, HTA uh, is what you can say that HTA is always about is to define not only the risk benefit because that was the last panel. So, is is a drug or a medical device better than its own side effects? Uh, but to look at the relative effectiveness. Is it better than what we already have on the market? And in that case, how much better? Mm. Um, whether HTA also includes health economics uh, and uh, decision making, that is different from different contexts and different member states and countries. Uh, from a TLV perspective, it is. We always add health economics to our relative assessment. Uh, but but that's not that's not always the case and and uh, now we then have a European regulation stating that the member states shall make joint clinical assessments uh, not joint health economics uh, but will establish then the relative effectiveness and the relative safety of uh, new products coming into the market uh, however not drawing the overall value conclusion of the product. Mm -hmm. So establishing the relative value of effectiveness, safety, and I would say uncertainty, but whether that product then can be deemed to be superior, better, overall concluded better uh, than another is left to the national uh, uh, competence. As in better, uh, in including worth the money. Uh, that's, that's the local... Uh, that uh, is... I, I wasn't part of writing the regulation, yeah. uh, but I think and one reason for making the full stop where we have might be that the next step for some of the agencies, some of the countries, comes very close to the money decision, mm -hmm. which by all means is a national competence. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's obviously how Europe is set up with certain uh, common uh, competency in the EU and other national competencies uh, in, in the member states. So that's a good clarification. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. But uh, when you, when more specifically than when it comes to at and um, uh, and, and what you heard from, from uh, Alliance for Regenerative Medicine's uh, analysis of the data then. Uh, mm. Should we worry or uh, do, you, do you think it's going to work anyhow or uh, do we need to develop uh, the current thinking in order to address this? We, we hear the concerns. We think they are actually a bit misinterpreted mm. uh, also because it was never meant to come to a joint overall conclusion in the in the products, 
uh, but but now we we know what what's out there, and and uh, of course we'll have to somehow try to relate to that. And ATMPs will come with a number of a number of f circumstances factors that we aren't very used to, mm. and and uh, we will will have to relate to that. We think that we have opened uh, from, and now I put on another hat, the, the hat of UNETA 21. We think that in a number of, of, uh, of uh, documents from UNETA 21, we have made clear that, that for example, indirect and direct and indirect comparisons might actually include single arm trials with external controls, but given with a number of, of uh, uh, cautions, Mm -hmm. It's obviously about the the robustness or the the level of uncertainty in the in the evidence presented, then uh, in order for to kind of be certain when you introduce a new, new technology. But uh, then, and sometimes people fear that if you do introduce something, you you cannot kind of take it back either. But but that's a different story. But but here you um, the uncertainty then. Uh, do you in this in this UNETA 21 or the the upcoming work in in this uh, joint clinical concepts assessment. How do you look at the uh, the kind of the ethics of randomized trials? If you ask for that, the, the, uh, sometimes it's it's small populations, it's dramatic effects, it's um, uh, it's difficult to randomize it, or if mm. if it's if it's even ethical to randomize in some settings. Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean. And, and then once again, there there uh, is already a suggested backdoor for for single arm trials. Uh, we see we see a worry if that becomes the norm or, or the, the 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 usual case, and and we have both today and and actually yesterday in in, in the other conference seen uh, examples of very, very clear effect, uh, effectiveness cases. Obviously, uh, it, it's without any clinical doubt that it is the, the effectiveness is connected to a certain treatment, almost a certain uh, uh, dosing uh, um, you know, time point. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's probably completely true, but we must set up a system that can make certain that we have the expected or uh, uh, assumed effectiveness in all the products that we introduce, especially, and, and once again, now coming into the national, especially since they come to a very high cost. Yeah. And, and we have heard this afternoon that, that Europe obviously is lacking behind. I don't think we can blame the HDR for that because that's only a year back. But, but if, if it's true that seven ATMPs <coughs> have been withdrawn from the European market, then my return question is, what was the price expectation for those treatments? Uh, there is and, and this morning we had a very interesting discussion where all the representatives in that panel were very you know, unified in the opinion that we must find a situation, we must land in a situation where we can afford to give equitable care to the citizens in Europe, appropriate and equitable care, and at the same time stimulate the innovation in Europe mm -hmm but not breaking the bank. Mm. Uh, so, so, I mean, no one is here to actually to save money on the healthcare, but we're interested to make sure that we can make fair decisions to distribute the health evenly between pe patients with a very high disease needs mm. and not break the bank. All right, uh, maybe we should let the mm, other panelists... We'll let uh, Francis uh, say something as well here, and also on the same topic uh, as uh, Niklas then, uh, because of the assessment of ATP, ATMPs are very difficult due to the uh, lack of uh, evidence available. So what, was, uh, what is your recommendations for, for, to make an assessment which is feasible in this situation with the specific, specific characteristics of the ATMPs? 
So, so first of all, you know, thank you uh, for the question and warm welcome, uh, Doug and, and Kerstin, and also thank you to Arm and ATMP Sweden for organising this panel. So it's certainly uh, an honour uh, and pleasure to be on this panel. Um, I think that we could all agree that um, HTA decision making, you know, sh should be based on best available evidence, right? And um, I, I think we're all in agreement regarding that. I mean, uh, however. I think there is a, a feeling that um, you know the HTA methods that undergo that or underpin a, a joint clinical assessment they should be certainly fit for purpose for a ATMPs, right? And 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 certainly in in regards to what's been proposed with um, UNETA 21 and applying those particular methods to ATMPs, um, I, I think there is a bit of a mismatch or you're unable to capture the entire value proposition of, of these uh, sort of ATMPs, right? So in regards to the, the areas of uncertainty, I mean, I think the first one, which has been kind of touched upon by Nicholas, which is the magnitude of the, of the treatment effect. Um, right, right now, um, and, and probably, you know, in the coming years, the single arm studies will be the vehicle for e evaluating that treatment effect, right? Um, the, the therapies, the, the ATMPs that are going to be coming to market over the next couple of years, it's going to be difficult to change those clinical development programs, right? To, 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 to incorporate randomised control trials. Those, tri those studies are close to, you know, regulatory, or close to being included in regulatory files, right? So you can't really do very much about that. But again, in terms of randomised control trials, is it particularly appropriate for the situation right is it appropriate for the disease itself you know so if you have a uh, for example um, a comparative study of a, of a of a gene therapy or atmp versus um you know stem cell transplantation or 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 um or, or small molecule biology actually when it comes to the randomization and blinding it becomes very very difficult right so so i think there has to be some kind of um level of comfort in using single arm single arm studies right and i, I think that's here to, here to stay it, it's not something that i guess you know developers you know prefer you know but it is inherent or characteristic of some of the disease areas that we are um you know researching and developing products for I think the second aspect is in terms of com comparability and as um, nicholas mentioned um it is essentially a relative effectiveness assessment, right? And, um, you know, if you have a single arm study and you have perhaps multiple comparators, then there has to be the acceptance in terms of the indirect comparisons or the methods of indirect, indirect comparisons. That, those methods have been evolving over the last 10, 15 years, right? I think there's a large health economic literature on that. And, um, but I, I think right now in the, um, in, in the consultation of what we've seen, it's been relatively light, right? So, and then the third, the third area is the durability. And um, uh, inevitably, the treatment effect is going to be studied within a, a trial or study, which will be of finite duration. And for the purposes of HTA, you want to be, they, you want to be able to extrapolate that treatment effect over to a lifetime horizon, um, possibly in the form of a health economic assessment, which will come after the, the JCA. Now, what we've seen so far is some variability in terms of the um, assumption or, or methods for that particular extrapolation, right? So what we've seen in Germany, 15 years perhaps for, um, you know, as an assumption for durability, nice 30 to 50 years. I think in, in some of the um, sort of Beneluxa, there's less, less, less than 10 years, right? So there's a bit of inconsistency there when it comes to the assessment of durability. And the durability, amongst other things, is probably the showstopper assumption, right? It is, it is the most important assumption, certainly when you, we're in, in, a, in an area where you have therapies of potential lifelong benefit, right? So, so, um, so the... Um, Certainly, the, the, Euro, the, the EU JCA has to certainly look at those particular areas in um, in, uh, in greater depth, and certainly for for for, for ATMPs. And um, I would also say, from a durability perspective, um, I guess more use of 
um, real world evidence, right? And, and having a kind of concerted approach to collecting that real world evidence. I guess for a, a rare disease, you may have very, very few patients in a particular country, right? So you may want to have some European wide system of, of real world evidence, so sort of data collection. And perhaps, you know, even going further, you know, coverage with evidence development as well, Rich, which is obviously, you know, after you've gone through the um, entire HTA paradigm through the, the clinical assessment and the, and, and the economic um, sort of evaluation, you know, you may want to have, you know, the coverage of evidence development type of situation. So, so just, a, just a couple of points there. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, I think also the long-term safety uh, might be something that has of course, to be of on course. as well yeah, from the patient point, yeah, uh, point of yeah, view. Yeah. And whose, uh, whose responsibility is it to, to create these uh, registries at the European level? Is it a private uh, uh, or a private public um, thing or yeah. how do you yeah, yeah. envision so, this? Yeah, so I mean, I, I think there is the obviously the potential for public-private partnership. I mean, I think outside of the ATMP space. I mean, I think in rheumatoid arthritis, there has been a very good example of collaboration in terms of creating registries that are European wide. And I guess the adjudication of the relative effectiveness or the, or the, the continued treatment benefit for a particular product has come from the registry, right? Of course, the statistical methods that are involved and um, the protocol for doing that you know, has, the governance is really, really important, right? But um, but certainly there are examples there that could be used, which are not necessarily in the ATMP space, that could be um, so potentially utilized. But a, a short follow-up question. There is a pilot on, ongoing now in, in EMA uh, who will look at the, the different re uh, real-world data from registries, uh, existing registries. And there was a report very recently from that, and, and, uh, and there was only one ATM product, ATMP product in that pilot, but uh, the result showed that, that the existing registries, they are not fit for a purpose. Uh, so that meant, I think, that you probably have to rebuild all the registries uh, from the beginning or at at least make big uh, changes in, in them. Uh, do you have any uh, some, uh, thoughts about uh, that? Do you, do you think that uh, we should build them from the beginning again or uh, revise those that exist? Yeah, I mean, I, I think certainly, you know, there are you know, best practice principles for setting up a, setting up a registry. I mean, I, I think if you have existing registries, you probably want to build upon you know, that particular data that's been collected so far. I mean, I mean, collection of data is um, invariably an expensive and um, it's a process that does rely usually on, on also goodwill of patients as well and their families, right? So there has to be that respect for, <coughs> in, in terms of utilizing data or, or data that's been collected, right? Rather than have multiple you know, registries, you know, and you're starting the data collection all over again. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think you, uh, HTA is all about using best available evidence, right? And mm -hmm. building upon, you know, data that's been sort of, you know, created previous, previously, you know, mm -hmm. uh, ideally. Yeah. So Jan, uh, you've been listening to this and, and um, a straight question could be, do, do you think this, um, uh, Patient access, ultimately, uh, you rep represent the patient organizations. Then, will this be accelerated or not by this uh, European uh, Union joint clinical assessment? I didn't get your question. Do you think the um, patient access uh, for ATMPs will be accelerated by uh, by European Union JCA? It has to be seen. Really, it has to be seen. Uh, we hope. That's why we have advocated to have a TMP in the scope of this regulation because we believe that a common a joint assessment of the clinical evidence for relative effectiveness should help to inform the decision at national level. So we, we, we hope, but it has to be seen. I hear also in the keynote speech before the, the fears and watching the showing the different of approaches between member states and that there is maybe more flexibility in some member states than what we could get at the European level. But until we really get started, we, we have to see. What I really regret is that in that period, there was not 
the resources made available in order to continue the pilots that were done before in the joint action of HTA yeah. and the seed project for the scientific uh, consultation. That really is a regret because I think a lot of the guidelines that are being developed could be informed by the practice and the new technologies coming in and, and the experience of working together, building that, that, that learning curve. So we regret, but that's where we are and that's what we have. So for us, what's very important now is the guidelines that are being developed and adopted by the EUNET uh, 2021. Then it will be after the practices. And in the practices, as we see really as key success factors to address some of the challenges that are highlighted, is that the conversation really takes place early and again between the regulators and HTA. Mm -hmm. And I cannot insist more and again and again, because this is the moment where regulators and HTA can agree on what is the level of, what's the type of evidence they want to see and the level of robustness of evidence they want to see. And that is in the conversation with the clinicians, with the patients, with the developers to see what's doable, what's not doable. And that's also the moment where, for instance, we see the absence of a natural history study or the need for a new one, where we see the registry and what kind of information we need in that re registry to have quality and to get it qualified by the scientific advice of EMA. But also then to have the colleagues from HTA at the unit HTA recognizing the value of that qualification at EMA, that then the data produced are recognized as robust. Mm -hmm. and so that's really the moment. And it's also the moment where we can discuss surrogate endpoints. We have that on different product and issues that there is no trust into the, the, the biomarkers for some of these uh, treatments. Or to discuss also the patients reported outcome measures so that we have also elements that are not completely anticipated when we start the development of the gene therapy to see what's the benefit from the patient perspective. But all that needs to be discussed early on and built in the development plan. Now, the second aspect of the practice where I have high expectations is to see not only the joint clinical, uh, the assessment of the clinical evidence for the relative effectiveness, relative safety, but also, as Niklas mentioned, the uncertainty. And that's key to really identify what is, what, where are all key questions? What kind of, what are the uncertainty that we want to reduce? Because mm -hmm. if we have clarity there, then that really helps to guide the collection of data at national level until we get something better to have a more structured approach to data collection post-marketing. But we, we need to have that. If not, we, we will procrastinate during years without any answer to your question on uncertainties and continue to discuss in some countries the cost of the medicine is too expensive, not enough expensive, I don't know, because we don't know what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And that's what we've been going through in the last 20 years in a lot of technologies, not ATMPs, but other bi biologicals, where 10 years later, we still didn't know more about uh, the, the, the real benefits and extent of effect of, of a product compared to what we knew already at the time of market organization. And that's not normal. That's a waste in the system. And that's a lose-lose for everyone, for the so payers, for the regulators, for the industry, for the patients first. Some of the, um, the, uh, the, the diseases in, in target for ATMPs are diseases where, where there is um, a poor outcome uh, with the standard care and, and there, are, there are very few, if any, uh, treatment options really at that, in that particular setting. Then, then it might be in a way easier to agree on what to compare against in a, in a uh, joint clinical assessment because it's a relative thing. Mm. Uh, but um, in other cases, also in the, in the area of ATMP, there might be a, a need for, for a, a lengthy process to agree on what to compare against. And that's potentially also kind of delaying things, not allowing anybody to move ahead of others if you expect everybody to start from the same starting point in Europe. Nicholas, uh, any comment on that? Um, um, no, I'm, I'm, I guess you're right. Sometimes it's, it's a given and sometimes it is very difficult to decide what's the relevant comparator. But if that is the also the clinical reality, we must, you know, try to answer the question even if it might be difficult. But it might be uh, 
different clinical realities in plural in different countries then, across different countries. And we have had a lot of discussion about the scoping phase of the joint clinical assessment process. Uh, the worry that uh, we will have 24 different PICO questions, for example, yeah. or 27, sorry, the number of member states. Some, something happened. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, but but um, we, we have spent a lot of time and work and effort on that, uh, trying to, to make sure that we stay at the minimal, n minimum number of relevant or needed PICO questions because yeah. the, it might still be that the therapeutic tradition is different in different member states mm -hmm. and then you can argue whether a joint report from from the coordination group in, in, in the long run then from UNETA can change the therapeutic tradition in in three member states in southern Europe or four in northern Europe or if it's better that then, then that a report actually reflects that difference. Um, but but we will not see 27 different, uh, I'm quite sure. Well, if that nobody would like to it, see... If yeah. that was the question. And, yeah. and to, to, to bring this into perspective, I think that's also a reason why... I mean, when I started working on the European level 15 years ago, those that nudged me, you know, in the side and said, when, we, when will we have a joint European system, a, an EMA on the HTA side? That was people from the companies, from the industry, that wanted more of a single, you know, entry point, that was frustrated about these 27 or 28 at that, that, that time, plus regional systems. So now we are more or less, you know, listening to that, more than companies did say that after, uh, eventually, but, but I clearly heard it first from the companies. And, and then I think we must, we must enter that process with, with an open mind. And, and the coordination group is set up since, was it November last year? The subgroups that are actually gonna take up the documents from UNETA 21 and make sure that they reflect not the, the, the opinion of 12 member states, but of 27, present to the coordination group their v version of that document or another document if it comes to that. Uh, so so uh, some of the details will actually be up for, for new discussions and, and will reflect when they come out the 27 member states. So, so I think we, we must be open. We, we hear the concerns. Uh, some are specific to ATMPs. Um, the durability of effect and the difference between the estimations we have to do and what we can actually see from clinical trials, I wouldn't say isn't unique for ATMPs. We're quite used to that. The challenge is when we, as the national pricing agency, reimbursement agency needs to relate to a one-off payment. <laughs> uh, that's perhaps uh, uh, unique for at &Ps. Also, this, this question about the registries, shall we go for established registries that are not totally fit for purpose or spend time and money to build new registries? I don't have the answer, but I can guarantee that the question is well known. Mm -hmm. We've been asking us that for, for almost 20 years. So, so uh, 18 piece might be challenging, but, but we, have, we have seen and we have succeeded to, to uh, have a functioning system uh, anyway. And then, last thing, when you ask, are we going to see an improvement or an enhancement? Is it going to get quicker? Well, I think also after seeing the slide deck today that we must first have a discussion about what is the baseline. I'm, I don't really agree that it looks this bad as we saw in Europe, but if it does, then we're quite well off in terms of improving. Um, yeah, there is always <laughs> a greater room for improvement if you start uh, from a, but the, the boring kind of signal is the, the number of phase one trials initiated. And that's, uh, but then, uh, but uh, then equity could be uh, defined as, uh, 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 everybody should have the same opportunity in a way. Uh, and, but then that could be equity within Europe and not necessarily across, across the globe, which is another bigger question, I think. But, but then uh, that there is a, there is a uh, kind of a, 
a balancing act between equity as you expressed it, uh, Nicholas, initially then, but also the, 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 the need to incentivize progress. Uh, so that's uh, that's really the, the conundrum here, I think. Uh, so any comments from, from you? From sure, uh, sure, yeah. So, so, certainly I just wanted to respond to some of Nicholas's uh, sort of um, points that he's, that, 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 that he's made. Certainly I, I think um, the, the number of uh, PICOs, so for people in the audience, you know, the population intervention comparator outcomes, right? I mean, having a manageable number of PICOs is certainly certainly welcomed, right? I mean, I think the the um, duration between um, the scoping and the submission of the of the dossier is is very, very short, right? So I think having a manageable number is um, is certainly cer certainly welcomed. And um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, when it comes to the number of PICOs as well, I mean, I think with some of the disease areas, rare disease areas, the, the evidence base could be quite compact which means that there, there could be a limited number of comparators, right? It could be just, you know, best supportive care or palliative care, for example. Whereas when you go into some of the uh, oncology indications, then you're talking about multiple modalities, multiple comparators. So I think, I think that's where it's going to be, you know, e extremely important and um, certainly encourage that there is uh, discussion, you know, within the, uh, w w w you know, on, 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 on that. You know, in in terms of the um, um, the, the issues, you know, regarding um, you know the evidence and, 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 and treatment benefit and the assessing treatment benefit, obviously, HTA organisations have a lot of experience there, and we, we certainly do 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 respect that. And uh, you know, I, I would say that um, in in terms of the you know the one-off payment aspect uh, aspect of it, right? Um, I mean, I, I think there has to be you know, the optionality there, right, in terms of having, you know, uh, you know, pay for performance mechanisms, right, um, you know, as, as, as well, um, you, know, um, uh, you know, you know, payment, payment over time, you know, I think the optionality is really, re really, really important. But certainly, when it comes to the fundamentals, it is the assessment of the value. And, um, you know, and that's where the, the technical side has to be has to be right, right? And uh, in terms of, of the methods, and uh, I think we've been discussing that you know, t today already. Um, yeah, I mean, I think in terms of the process, I mean, I think what you want to do is you have the European JCA. Um, you want to ensure that that JCA is only performed once. It doesn't have to be, you don't want it to be replicated at the individual country level in which that you're kind of repeating the work. It's going to have resources, not just for you know, the, the, um, you know, the agencies, the health technology assessment agencies involved, but also with a company as well, right? And ultimately what will happen is that you'll have delays in, in patient access, and then you're gonna have um, inequity in terms of patient access across the European continent. So, um, so I think the, the two aspects, the technical aspect, and also the pro procedural aspect, you know, certainly, you know, certainly welcome sort of a further discussion on. There are obviously two steps to, to achieve patient access, or perhaps three, uh, affordability in the end, also uh, in the local healthcare system. But, but the two steps, uh, the, the regulatory process and then uh, the, the health technology, which starts with the own clinical assess assessment, the, the relative effectiveness. Then uh, the, the uh, European regulatory package, uh, the, the form package now, includes this conditionality of if you are able to generate or, or establish uh, patient access in all the 27 member countries, uh, you will have the uh, additional data protection. Will this uh, joint clinical assessment actually help facilitate uh, that? I know it's the intent, but uh, how can we be sure and what's, what will be the, the things that needs to be delivered by the JCA in order to to support uh, patient access in 27 countries. Another question for me, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So, okay. I mean, I, I think I think this um, sort of JCA is a is a real opportunity, right? You know, if um, if it's going to be done, you know, correctly in terms of ensuring that you have sort of ro ro a robust cross-border kind of fr fr framework. I mean, I think now. As what's been mentioned, you know, you go you're going country by country. You have a single 
assessment and um, you know the, 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 comp the relative clinical assessment is the rate limiting step of all HGA processes, right? Whether it's yeah, certainly at the individual country country level. So, so th there is a real real opportunity, but but and also in in terms of um, efficient use of resources, which is what, what I've mentioned, mm -hmm. not just from the agency side, but also from the company company side. And you want to want to avoid duplication of, of, of effort. I think there's also you know benefits in terms of perhaps scale as well you know mm -hmm. so if you, if you have real world evidence data collection then you can go european Euro european wide however however you know having said that you know it, the, the methods do have to be tailored and appropriate for for, for atmps right mm -hmm. from from the technical perspective and and that's really you know first and foremost really 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 important otherwise you'll have the replication at the individual country level post gcja that will just, um, you know, cause, you know, further patient, you know, further delays in access and inequity. And uh, you know, these patients have been waiting a long time actually for, um, for many of these therapies. I mean, that's something that uh, Jan always always mentions about. Um, you know, you know, these, these patients have been waiting a long time, and uh, you want to be able to shorten or not ensure that um, in the process takes an additional day longer than it needs to be. Right. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, right. So any, any quick comments from Jan or, or Niklas on that? Uh? If we uh, end up in a situation where the assessments are being redone in the, ne in the member states, that's a lose-lose situation. Mm. Yeah. And the one that loses le least, I think, is, are the companies because the regulation states that they must only submit once. So the losers will be the member states because they will have to spend resources on something that should already have been done together jointly and we don't have those resources in many countries. Uh, and the patients that stand the risk of having to wait for another assessment, which is also difficult to see because it, the regulation only stipulates timelines for the joint assessment, but the expectations are quite tight in us uh, uh, after that. So, so I really, really hope that we will not end up there. So that's a scenario we should watch out for if, the, if we start to see that. Uh, uh, and, and especially ourselves. Yeah. We shall look yeah. what, what And are you that. patients? Uh, we should remind ourselves about patients. Uh, Jan, that's your... Uh, we need to, to try and to trust, really. I, I, now we... The regulation is what it is. There is certain number of member states, members said, coming together to develop all the all the, all the core uh, element to, to get started. So let's get started and see where, where we get. So that kind of conversations and there is all processes of stakeholder consultation in the context of the United HTA, which gives opportunities to raise all these concerns and try to address them and try to the but again or or main concern, at least for us, is is not in. I fully agree with all the concern that Francis expressed also on on the methods and all that. But the, it's it's really how we reduce the the, the uncertainties after that. This is where we're concerned because yeah. today, when the products are coming in, and often particularly in some of the potentially curative therapies, it's 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 on babies or children which have already developed a lot of the symptoms of the diseases because the newborn screening is not yet in place. So we, we come with evidence which are limited, which are difficult to measure, which are when in fact common sense shows that there is a high potential, but common sense is not sufficient to base decisions to do clinical assessment. So this is part of really of, of our concern. That's why also in parallel we do promote newborn screening and early detection significantly. Mm -hmm. uh, in order also to have trials made earlier in, in, uh, in yeah. patients. So uh, maybe we should uh, see if there's anybody, uh, uh, any questions from the floor? The young man in the blue shirt. <laughs> no, I'm just. I'm just. Uh, I mean, uh, I, mean I, I can make a comment on yeah, the, please, the newborn screening. So, I mean, I, I think, you know, when, when you have patients that are treated pre-symptomatically, I think generally you'll have the, 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 the optimal, you know, most optimal outcomes, right? And um, to be able to identify those patients pre-symptomatically, you need newborn screening, right? And, and, and I think what, what we're, right, right now, newborn screening, it tends to, 
there is a variability in a newborn screening across across countries in terms of the conditions that are being screened, in terms of the techniques that, that are being utilized, right? And also certainly with the advent of whole genome sequencing, for example, you know, which is going to be certainly the, the future will probably revolutionize healthcare as well, right? Um, so I think when it comes to the JCA and perhaps to do subsequent health economic assessment or pricing discussion. Also, there is the other part, which is the newborn screening. And, and implementing newborn screening at population level does also pose a kind of risk benefits, cost, cost effectiveness aspect to it as well, right? And uh, so it is, you know, to, to, to have a, 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 a um, ATMP available for a particular population it's it's not just the, the perhaps the, the back end of the process, you know, after the regulatory approval. There's still the the other stuff that needs to be done, you know, in terms of the newborn screening, you know, the, the setting up a treatment, uh, you know, qualified treatment centres, um, the ERNs, you know, all that all that all that sort of stuff, right? So, it's um it's a multi pronged approach to bring a therapy to yeah. you know to you know to a particular population. All right. Yes, I actually have a final uh, question because I was uh, listening here and thinking about the uh, competitiveness in, in Europe and uh, uh, I see that uh, there are different data required for the whole uh, ecosystem for different parts of developing an ATMP. Uh, so would it somehow be possible to foster all the um, developers uh, and all the researchers already from the very beginning of the early development to actually collect the correct type of data needed for the whole process uh, would that be at all uh, possible because uh, to, to, uh, to my knowledge the, the preclinical researchers they don't even think about that the, uh, things will ev eventually ever end up in a, in a dossier at EMA is it possible um, um, I go first and then Francis can, can respond. I think it is. I don't know for sure, but I think it is. Uh, we can probably, from the HTA world, be more clear of, on what we need. Uh, we, I think in, in, over time we will prove that we will converge more under the regulation it hasn't come into been implemented yet so so but we can be more clear and explicit about what we need but i think at least when i go to scientific advice meeting we did go to scientific advice meeting i know that at that time there was a large job to be done internally in the companies to make sure that the preclinical and the clinical people listened and listened more also to the health outcomes people, etc. Because uh, sometimes I think we stated quite obvious things, but people in the development team hadn't listened to their colleagues that were typically then on the, on the value and outcomes side. So, so I think from both sides and inviting probably patients more, especially in a scientific advice uh, or joint scientific consultation situations, could be a key to that. And I think it is work to do. Mm -hmm. So competent uh, personnel on both ends, I guess, is needed then in order to ask the right questions and listen well. Yes. Mm. And in the morning, the, the key word became to break the ego system <laughs> and create the ecosystem. Okay. That's a nice I think summary. in on in all organizations we have senior people and junior people, mm -hmm. and it might be that the junior people actually can contribute to things that is gonna be needed. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a good good way of. Uh, well, I think we're coming to a close, and and I um, I think we should um, thank the panel, mm -hmm. uh, Jan, again. Once more, uh, Nicholas and, and Francis, uh, thanks a lot for a, 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 a great dialogue, a, an exchange rather than a debate, I think, uh, which I think is uh, very much in line with what we, uh, what we ask for in, in this, to listen well to each other and, and then continue to do this together. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So now we are at the end uh, of this event, and uh, we would like to invite Lars Hammarström uh, for a concluding remark. Lars is the Director of Health and Life Science at the Swedish Governmental Innovation Agency, Vinova. And Vinova's day job is to elicit innovation for cross-functional initiatives, uh, mostly in Sweden. And now we are very eager to hear your uh, conclusions uh, and, uh, uh, from, from these two very interesting sessions today. So what have we learned and what needs still to be done? And uh, did we miss anything during these panels? Well, Please. thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to close today. Uh, Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, if you're like me and I've been here for uh, 48 hours now, uh, you're pretty full up. So uh, the, uh, it's, of course, an honor to be able to close uh, a session like this. The, uh, the downside of being the last speaker is that it's almost impossible to say anything that hasn't been said already. Uh, so I will make this brief. It won't take more than you know, 45 minutes or so. Just, just kidding. Um, so my name is Lars Hammerstrom. As I said, uh, I'm the Director of Health and Life Science at Sweden's innovation agency, Vinova. Uh, Vinova is a public funding agency, uh, and we're also an expert authority to the government on research and innovation policy. Um, so it's going to be in that perspective that I give these remarks. Uh, Vinova is very heavily invested in the promise that advanced therapies bring to patients in Europe uh, and in Sweden. Uh, our investments include supporting some of Sweden's most prolific life science initiatives, such as Genomic Medicine Sweden, uh, Cytiva Testa Center, the Innovation uh, Center at Northex Biologics, uh, the BioVenture Hub at AstraZeneca, uh, Genova, Indicel, um, the National Swedish Research Program for Biological Drugs, and most recently, as we heard earlier, the establishment of CCRM Nordic as a center for scaling and commercialization of advanced therapies. And I'm very happy that there is a side event dedicated to ATMPs at this event. Um, the EU Presidency Conference on, on Personalized Medicine has very much looked into the complexity of introducing these types of therapies. Uh, and ATMPs in many ways represent a physical embodiment of a lot of those complexities uh, that have to do with precision medicine. And this, of course, is a development that's made been possible by the transformational discoveries that we've made within recent years in medicine, in digitalization, bioengineering, uh, molecular biology, and materials technology. Innovations that really would not have been possible without a firm and long-term European commitment to the value and potential of excellent research in science and technology. We know, however, that the challenges of ATMPs stretch far beyond just the science and technology that's available to us, and we've heard many examples of that today. It requires new paradigms, not just for process development and manufacturing, for designing clinical trials, for regulatory approval, uh, clinical assessment, um, pricing and reimbursement, uh, and not least for skills development within the workforces that are involved, both in the industry, in academia, and in healthcare. And it's a very complex development that requires a systematic approach and a high degree of internationalization, which is why it's important that it's brought up uh, on an EU level. So we need innovation on all these levels. Now, beyond the obvious therapeutic potential that these medicines pose to patients with unmet medical need, they also present a great value proposition for our biotech, pharmaceutical, and CDMO industry here in Europe. It's estimated that by 2032, the global gene and cell therapy market will exceed $20 billion annually. With its internationally renowned academic institutions, innovation capacity, collaborative culture and world-class healthcare systems, Europe has all the prerequisites required to take a significant position in this emerging economy. However, as we've also heard today, EU is falling behind. We're falling behind US and Asia, both in terms of fundamental investments in R&D and on clinical trials. 
Uh, we heard this by Mark earlier, uh, and to quote some recent figures from, from FPIA, in, in 2002, the US spent about $2 billion more than Europe on fundamental R&D investment. Today, that figure is 25 billion. So the gap is widening. Clinical trial activity within ATMP is twice as high in the US and almost three times as high in China as it is in Europe. And the number of ATMP trials conducted in US and Asia grew by 70 and 67% annually, respectively, from 2014 to 2021, while that figure in Europe remained essentially stagnant. Sweden, for example, has one of the highest numbers of ATMP startups per capita than any other country in the world. But historically, we have failed to see those companies scale and thrive fully in the European market. And this is something that Vinova is working very hard to remedy. I think it's especially relevant to discuss in light of the possible effects of the new EU pharma regulation can have on directing life science R&D investments internationally. Those of you who work in the pharmaceutical industry know that this is a global industry. Uh, global Pharma does their investments where they get the best return of investment. Bottom line. And as we heard Minister Bush uh, say earlier today, our aim needs to be to create the best possible ecosystem for R&D investment in Europe. And EU continuing to lag so far behind US and Asia is not only a risk to the competitiveness of our industry. The intrinsic quality of our healthcare system is heavily codependent on the presence of a strong and innovative life science industry. They are the ones who often induce uh, and incentivize the clinical trials, uh, support the regulatory issue development, care routines, etc., and the competence development within our healthcare system. So a risk to EU's industry is also a risk to the equity and access of medicines to our citizens and risk their access to the best possible treatments. In Sweden, medical products account for one of the largest exports also and contributes significantly to the financial stability of our welfare system. So a fall in that presence will have significant impact on our wealth, on our healthcare as well. So, in conclusion, the, yes, the EU has centuries-old strong heritage in the life science. We all know this, but we can't rest on our laurels and expect to come out ahead. The world and the world of technology moves too fast, and there are too many that want to be in the lead. So, in Lewis Carroll's famous book, Looking Through the Hourglass, sorry, Through the Looking Glass, <laughs> Um, the Red Queen tells Alice that the world keeps shifting so quickly under her feet that she has to keep running just to keep her own position. And this is our reality with advanced therapies in Europe. If we're not running faster, we're going to be standing still, or in worse case, moving backward. Regardless, if we don't rush now, we will be outrun. So Vinova will continue to invest with the aim of establishing Sweden and Europe at the international forefront of ATMP development. But we can't do this alone. We need a strong convergence around ATMPs from all member states and across all sectors. And as we move now into the sunset of the Swedish EU um, presidency of the council, and we pass the baton over to Spain, I'd like to urge them also to keep the ATMP agenda alive during their term. Together, I believe, we can make the necessary difference and re-establish EU as a global leader in advanced therapies and in life science in general. Thank you very much. Very nice. Thank you, Lars. Uh, uh, just uh, a, a few uh, uh, final comments from, from the two of us. Uh, we spent the better part of a, a long afternoon uh, talking about ATMPs and European competitiveness. And, um, uh, we hope that this has been uh, something interesting uh, and that, that some of the discussions will actually have uh, also some kind of duration of effect. Uh, this has been taped, so we have an audience here in the, in the room, we have an audience uh, in the stream, but it, it, it could also be viewed after the meeting uh, at atmpsweden.se. Uh, so, Kerstin. 
Yes, yes. So now, of course, we would like to thank all the speakers and all the panelists and also our colleagues at the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine and everyone who works with ATMP in Sweden and in Europe. So thank, thank you all. And it's been a, a great pleasure to serve as you guide through this. I think we've had the most easy, easy part of the work, uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's very complex. And I realize that it's also sometimes a, a very kind of advanced discussions that needs to take some time. I think we've had a, a very uh, lucky setup or a, it's a, in terms of the panelists in the ability to actually have a, a, a very mature dialogue about this rather than a debate. Uh, so, um, we always need to um, remind ourselves what probably we heard uh, in, in one of the first sessions, that the, the entire reason why we're here, why we're doing this, is because of patient needs. There are some kind of side effects in terms of uh, industry and, and contribution to economy and so forth and competitiveness of other kinds that, that, that are also important. But if you, you can combine these two, you, you address the patient needs, but also then the uh, build up an industry aspect of this, then, then you can do some double good in society in that sense. Uh, yeah. So thank you all uh, participating on the video link. And all of you here in the room, you are now welcome to the reception, which is just outside. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.